Yeah, basically with a with a sub pack. When I'm a being at the end, so like let's say I'm doing a hip hop record and I like how a song on Kanye's last record hit, I'll bring it up. But when you're a being, if you can literally feel the energy of the low end and feel where it's hitting on your back, you can just go in with an EQ and literally just move it around until it feels physically the same as Kanye's last record. That's wild. Wow. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. You may already know that using true analog gear is one of the best ways to create a great record. Yet increasingly, we live in a digital world, recording and mixing inside the computer. So what if you could have the best of both worlds? Tegeler Audio Manufacturer is bridging the analog-digital divide by creating high-end analog gear like the Schwerkraft Maschine compressor and the Raumzeit Maschine reverb whose knobs you can control remotely using a plug-in in your DAW. Or their many analog units like the Cream bus compressor with mastering EQ or the VeriTube recording channel that let you save your settings using a custom recall sheet plugin, offering a complete line of pro audio gear from compressors to EQs to reverbs and beyond. Now you can get a pro analog sound while benefiting from the power of digital. Let your DAW help you move your knobs so that your music can move you. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about Tegeler Audio Manufactor. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Derek Olds, an independent artist working on his own solo record and also an instructor at the Los Angeles Film and Recording School in Hollywood. He's heavily involved in the audio and tech worlds and has run the Solemony or Celemony uh, Melodyne booths at NAM, AES, IMSTA, and the Grammy PE party uh, for 2014 to 2018, where we met. He's produced and performed over 1,200 live shows worldwide in over 10 countries and is currently planning his upcoming tour in support of his first solo record release. And over the past decade, Derek has had the pleasure of sharing his talent with many of his idols, such as Prince, Oprah Winfrey, Bone Thugs, Common, A Tribe Called Quest, and Justin Bieber, to name a few. Derek often describes the computer as just another instrument, another tool to convey emotion. As a result, he has strived and excelled in every aspect of modern music, from writing to performing, production, and sound engineering, resulting in truly individual records. Derek has his hands in many aspects of the music business in Los Angeles as artist, producer, and engineer, and I'm looking forward to digging into some great questions about modern pop production and see what new things we can also learn about one of my favorite production tools, Melodyne. Please welcome Derek Olds to Recording Studio Rockstars. Derek, my man, are you ready to rock? Absolutely, and always. What's up, Lige? Nice to see you again, and it's cool. To, the, yeah, I know we tried to reschedule this interview, so I'm glad we were able to be here. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, I've been looking forward to it a lot. So you sounded, you were mentioning that you're coming to us from kind of a cool place. It's like an old theater or something, huh? Yeah, actually, here at the, the film school uh, in Hollywood, it's the LA Film and Recording School. Um, they have a theater they bought about, about eight years ago. It's the Ivar Theater. It's right on like... Uh, uh, Selma and um, Coenga, right around the Hollywood Vine, the W Hotel area. It was built in the 50s, and it's like got ghost stories, and you know it's on all these ghost tours around LA. Nice, so I get to man. teach here every day and teach people how to put on shows in an old theater. So, Elvis used to play here, and all this, all this fun stuff. What's the scariest <laughs> thing in that theater? This interview we're about to do? Probably, yeah, I think so. <laughs> we're about to melt some faces. Melt some faces. Don't even faces. know it's coming. Yeah, that, that's such like a Hollywood thing too, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we melt a lot of faces in Hollywood. Sure. Awesome, dude. Well, so <laughs> I, I've given a little bit of an intro, but tell us more about yourself and who you are, and and um, you know your 
your journey into recording and and what kind of stuff you're doing oh man yeah um <clears throat> let's see i i grew up thinking i was going to be like a doctor or something like a lot of people um went to college at unc chapel hill go tar heels oh yeah in north Car- north carolina where i'm from and um great music, music. Scene there too oh absolutely yeah there's there's so much so much cool stuff going on constantly i think i played every bar in the raleigh durham area and it was like literally like 200 something so that's pretty awesome like so many venues um yeah, yeah just found that uh found music after my freshman year my dad was a musician um and just it's been 24 7 since uh, ended up studying psychology just to learn better how to how to write better and understand people and you know learn as how you know, to that's a big part manage of this whole a band <laughs> exactly yeah it's all like like you know crazy people all getting along it's great um yeah and then uh joined a band we got signed uh our producer had an affair with our investor's wife we got dropped um no way. and it was a big deal you know <laughs> that's awesome that's the I love how you just dropped that in there like that <laughs> it's the first time i got burned by this industry it's been a few more after that but so you know funny. so long story short but i got to work with one of my future mentors carlos alvarez on on the, that record we were signed up to universal for like distribution and carlos alvarez do you know him by any chance uh, not yet no oh yeah, yeah he's uh he was the the president of the uh Grammy association in miami for about three years when I lived in his, um, his vocal booth. And so that's where you are. My you're now in, in Miami or you're no, I'm in, you're, uh, you're LA. in LA. Okay, great. I'm in great, Hollywood. Great. Uh, I'm in Hollywood right now. Um, but yeah, I lived in Miami. I was kind of on the road for about 10 years straight. Um, but I did a stint where I like got my mail in Miami at his studio. So, um, yeah, just, you know, really cut my teeth in recording and saw he's got over 15 Grammys. So, you know, nice. That's more Grammys doing. than me. Yeah, right. <laughs> so he uh yeah, he, he opened my eyes and I, I when the band fell through, um I moved to Brazil for about a year, um, and pretty much traveled straight doing music, living in the studios until about f- four years ago I moved to LA and it's just I barely left because it's just every single day I do something I would have flown here to do anyways. You so know? you were in Miami, um and then you went to Brazil. So is the music that you were doing at that time, was there sort of a South American uh, aspect to it of, of any sort? I mean, I would, I would say so. I was, you know, my, my solo stuff that I've been always working on is it's kind of like more, more rock soul, but I've done, you know, I was doing about half hip hop and half, yeah, Latin stuff. My mentor, yeah. uh, you know, was great, huge Latin uh, engineer, mixing, mastering. So I was around that a lot, uh, but when I went to South America, it was through um, it was through a piano player that did some session work at that studio. And then we, uh, after the band broke up, I had to, I had to like hit the road or something. I became a solo artist because it was just like you know how it is in any band. It's like you're you're married to every person in the band, and then yeah, you, totally. the breakups really bad. So right. so anyways, I um I had an opportunity to go down there to help uh, produce a samba record, and ended up two weeks turned into two months turned into a long time and uh you know got to really cut my teeth as an artist and as a guitar player you know i learned you know it, like in a country like brazil if you're going to be a guitar player when you're 18 you started at three because your parents decided wow you know in and, and a lot of ways so every musician i was surrounded by was even if they were you know 16 years old they had been playing for 10 years and you're like yeah, I, I have to catch up. <laughs> so, well, so I really cut my teeth, you know. That's doing cool. That. And I and I didn't know I wasn't preparing any questions like that, but it, I'm really intrigued and I want to, you know, ask yeah. you like what are some of the things that you felt like you learned about the importance of rhythm and music and stuff through that whole experience? Yeah, I mean, it's you said it, you know, rhythm. Rhythm, rhythm, it's kind of like, you know, if you're shopping for a house, the location, location, location. I I really think rhythm I think that I, I read something somewhere that one percent of humans are rhythm deaf, so they just can't, you know, do do four on the floor. And then five percent of people are tone deaf. That's what I've heard and uh, kind of teach a lot. So I hope it's right. <laughs> That's awesome. You, um, remember, you remember the jerk, yeah. the jerk, where um, in that movie where he can't tap his foot until he finally can. You know, yeah, I guess he was oh, in the one yeah. the one percent. I've definitely known Grammy award winning producers that cannot clap on four on the floor really they got grammys yes i'm not gonna mention any names but <laughs> that's fascinating you you've run into those people Liz, that 
we're just in the right place at the right time and can, you know, you can have a whole career off of one good moment in yeah. this industry. So yeah, you might not enjoy the rest of it, but. <laughs> well, so, I mean, we don't have to yeah. go too far down this rabbit hole, yeah. but like, do you yeah. specifically remember any points where like you had a, like an aha moment about the way rhythm went together or like about a beat that wasn't just the one, two, three, four and the way it all fit together? Yeah, totally. Um, there was, I, I'd say a couple, one was, you know, I grew up listening to, you know, heavy rock and, you know, Zeppelin tool, learning how you can write an incredibly catchy and singable melody over a song that's like four, four, then six, eight, then seven, four, then 11, you know, 16. And, you know, like tool and, and some bands could move time signatures underneath a crowd singing along, like they know every lyric. And that really hit me, you know, um, with the creativity you can do with time signatures without really messing up the integrity of a real great storytelling experience with a song. But also when I was in Brazil, you know, they, they would just have a click on pretty much with everything they did ever. And they never performed with a click, but their rehearsal part of it was to lock in their, their bodies. And you know that feeling uh, if you're, you know, any musician out there, click, it's just not fun playing to a click at the beginning. And then eventually it kind of like moves from the front of your brain to like, it feels like it's just slapping you in the back of the head and you don't think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. But it's just like this internal, I remember when I was in Brazil, I was struggling, struggling, struggling. And then all of a sudden it just kind of clicked. And since then it's just, you know, a click has been a click clicked. No, you know, right. No, no fun. (laughs) And there's the expression here about, you know, a drummer. It's like when you're right on, you just bury the click, bury it. So it it gets buried in the sound because it's so matched up with whatever else is happening. Absolutely. You don't even hear it at some point. Well, very cool. All right. So um, you ended up out in LA. Now you're teaching, uh, you know, audio at the school there. You're making your own record as well. Um, You want to share any stories about that kind of experience getting into all that? Yeah. um, How did I get into teaching? Uh, Part of it is, I, I think starting with like my generation, we I, I basically have had YouTube since I really started geeking out <laughs> in life, you know, and I started yeah. a little late. So, so I could just, you know, the, the rate at which you get used to learning on this planet at this point, like kids these days, just, it's just like, you know, an open floodgate, just, you know, things coming in their brain and, you know, like, like they're two years old until they're 18. There's just so much information coming in. Um, I got so used to that, that, you know, then I started, you know, really cutting my teeth with mentoring, you know, being, apprenticeships and all that kind of stuff and just seeing it done in real life. But I, at some point I felt like I was not learning. I was learning something new and cool, like t- two things a month. And I was used to 2000 a day, you know? So, yeah. um, that's why I got back, you know, really said, how can I keep learning? So, you know, as fast as I can, it was, it was teaching, um, the, you know, so, so that's kind of how I got into that. And then, you know, the, L- the LA film school was kind of always my, um, goal. Cause I lived, outside of America for about, you know, six, seven years. And I came back and I heard LA film school abroad. So I was like, that's where I'll teach if I ever. Yeah, totally. Well, so what are some of the classes and, and, um, skills that you're, is there anything that you're like regularly teaching there or is it always switching up? Totally. Totally. No. Um, here at the, the Ivar theater, uh, it's basically, Oh, it's an old theater. You know, Elvis used to perform here. Grateful Dead did a live album, Snoop Dogg, performed here a lot. It was a strip club for like 20 years. <laughs> what was the Grateful Dead album? Um, it was it was like live at the Ivar. It's all over YouTube. Okay. Okay, but I'm cool. not sure if it was an official, re- I don't think it was official release. It was, but it was, it was a long time ago. <laughs> um, yeah. So I teach live production. So basically live sound, lighting, just putting on a show in a theater. And we have a theater to ourselves. So that's kind of cool. And I teach songwriting and like, you know, um, vocal production, you know, often, you know, the, yeah. the melody stuff so very cool so uh hey just preface this rock stars apologies from us uh if skype uh sort of like you know sounds a little funny on his voice but we're just gonna hang in there and power through um, okay yeah it's the theater i'm yeah, sorry you, what can you do man it's we're we're <laughs> yeah. in we're it's the internet you know internet's from the it's from the 50s too so <laughs> <laughs> right on right. um okay so uh let's uh let's jump forward a little bit too because um you know one of the things that i met you around was melodyne um, I believe was it at, at uh, Na- the Nam show? Um, yeah, yeah, this year. Yeah, and so um, I love using Melodyne, and I-, I think it is a really powerful tool. And I'm excited to talk to you about some of the 
uh, extra stuff it might do, you know, thinking outside of the box for all of us. Great. But, um, but you know, like when you um, are going into songwriting and stuff, I mean, Melodyne's a great tool, but I imagine maybe you start out in a, in a different DAW. Um, I don't know if you, I know Melodyne can act as a DAW itself, but do you like to approach songwriting for your music um, using Pro Tools or Logic or one of those kind of things? Yeah, I, um, I, I also, you know, had, had worked for Apple on and off for about six years, like part of the audio team. Um, so I've, it's kind of like religion or, or uh, your sports or whatever. It's kind of where you were born or what you learned first is kind of usually the one that people are like, this is the only one. Right. You know, Pro Tools, I use, you know, I, I teach advanced Pro Tools here, but also Logic. It's, Logic's my go-to for pretty much pretty much everything at this point, except for, you know, the stuff I use Melodyne for. Um, but I also use Pro Tools half the time when I'm in major studios. They, they might have Pro Tools and you, you got to know them both. Uh, and I use Ableton on stage, like, all oh, cool. Way. I love Ableton you know, Live. Just, um, really love it. Oh, my God. <laughs> you, there's nothing you cannot do if well, you want to just route and route and route, you know? Yeah, well, we'll dig into some stuff like that. Yeah, so, so that'll totally. be kind of cool. Um, so, so you're using Logic a lot to write with. What are some of the things about Logic that make a lot of sense to you or seem to it seems to excel at as far as, you know, composing and writing? Uh, I, I think for composing writing it's it's mostly about the the take folders and the comping situation and logic i just love it compared to you know pro tools you know it's great you have a key command what is it um option command v or whatever that that puts something up into the main playlist but in in logic just being able to swipe um yeah, if you use that basically yeah and you basically can just record over yourself over yourself and <laughs> unfortunately well fortunately and unfortunately being you know one of the the uh, reps for Melodyne, I get I I have the opportunity to to work with a lot of uh, not so great singers, <laughs> right? So when you have to do these horrible mountain lifting, you know, vocal projects where there's seventy takes of everything, and you might, you know, I've done one recently where there was not two words next to each other from the same take once in the entire song, yeah. you know. But then you can build something, you know. You can make. I always say you can make a. A dying goat sound like Britney Spears or something if you work hard, <laughs> well, hard enough at it. <laughs> let's assume for a minute that that's not our goal to yeah, uh, right. to work with terrible stuff. But let's yeah, just let's, let's talk a little bit about that, yeah. some of the ways that you um, like to comp in Logic. So, right. um, maybe break it down for the rockstars a little bit. Some of there are some of us sure. like myself included where I'm fascinated by Logic. I know I can stumble around it and I can figure mm -hmm. a few things out. But I always love hearing somebody describe some of the specifics about use case because. Um, there's always something for me to learn. So of course. if you um, describe maybe, you know, step-by-step -step a workflow where you record a vocal in, you've got five takes and you're comping it together. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, get a, get a track up, get your input. I, well, we'll go into this later, but I, I use the, you know, UAD Apollo twin situation with the Unison plugins and it's just mm -hmm. mind blowing and I love it. But so that's usually my chain now. Um, and then, you know, just get the singer to start singing, record everything, you know, even the warm up takes. You never know when someone's just been dying to sing something and they kill it the first take, you know, and then hey, they don't really know how to do it again. Let's even oh. back up for a sec and address is, is latency an issue? Is there anything we want to know about making sure we don't have awkward latency in our headphones? Yeah, totally. Um, that's one of the reasons when I kind of, I guess, switched to Logic, uh, the low latency mode in Logic is has just been like almost magic to me for a while now. Um, obviously, it, it depends on what plugins you decide, but you know my plugin chain will you know let's say it consist of like an EQ and then I use a lot of Voxingo stuff. So maybe you know a compressor, a preamp, whatever. The Unison stuff for UAD has zero latency on the way in, okay. so I, I use it kind of as an outboard gear. And then I'll go down to you know 128 um, on the buffer size, or sometimes even 64 if it's kind of a new session and. I, I don't experience latency, but that low latency mode in Logic is basically what it does is it disables any plugins that are causing more than a certain threshold of late latency. So if it's, you know, four milliseconds, which, you know, a lot of belie people believe that's how long it takes the brain to process something anyways. You know, if, if you want to keep <laughs> it right around there, yeah. Mine might take a little longer. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, did, how, how were you in the 60s and 70s, Liz? <laughs> uh, I was very little. Okay, it was, cool. It was a little cool. boy. But um Great. Okay, so yeah. uh, where do we find this low latency setting? Um if you go uh 
it's it's one of the like um, extra key commands you can assign. I forget the key command, um, but I put it up in my customizable bar at the top. Oh, I see. And I just okay, make cool. sure because I want it to be visible because I really want to make sure it's on when I'm working with a major artist that you know because it's a difference in like no latency and what you're used to dealing with. You know, very cool. And it just right. cuts off any plugin that's using more than whatever your threshold is. You know, okay, so that's cool. cool. And then I have them take it, take it. Um, Basically, if you record over something in Logic, then it makes a new take folder or a new take and a take folder. So you don't even have right? to say, I'm going to do a new take. You just record yeah. again and you just Yeah, no playlisting. Again. You don't have to, yeah, you don't have to make a playlist before or after. And it just, so eventually you'll have, let's say we do, you know, six takes of, of the first verse. Then you'll have a take folder that you can expand down and see all six takes. And then you just take your mouse and just swipe and it, it highlights wherever you swipe. And then you can select between all the takes with your mouse, and it does all your cross fades for you. It makes the master, um, you know, playlist. Um, now the cool thing, and this this was a big announcement at at Nam for Melodyne, was that um, we are we've been working with Apple um, over the past couple of years to incorporate it with ARA, the um, Audio Random Access, which everyone's using now. Basically, it allows you know uh, plugin developer developers and and DAW developers to interact with each other and, and mm-hmm. all around in kind of all kinds of ways and send audio uh, through the sound card. So um, now Melodyne is going to work without having to transfer things in, kind of like St- Studio One mm-hmm. in a way. Studio One's completely integrated. But now while you're doing take folders in Logic, you'll be able to Melodyne each take, timing, pitch, the whole nine yards as you're comping. So you don't you no longer have to make that decision Okay, this is a, a awesome take with emotion, but it's it's pitchy. And then here's a perfect take without emotion. Uh, you know, before you had to decide which one, like, is the bad one too bad to fix? Mm-hmm. And we all know that feeling. It's like, dang, you know. So now you can fix it as you go. <laughs> so then you swipe after that, and and you've already comped and tuned just once as you go. So I'm really ex- like, Very cool. it's going to so, save me thousands of hours. <laughs> so I can stay inside the DAW and then I can just selectively tune one note within my session. Whereas the way I, the way I've been working, if I'm in Pro Tools is I will, I've, I just felt like it was easier to navigate if I was inside the Melodyne studio app and I would mm-hmm. export all my consolidated vocal tracks from, from top to bottom and the mix on a separate stereo track import those all into Melodyne and start working there and then export all those and bring them back into Pro Tools. So I don't really have to do all that stuff, at least if I'm in Logic. Absolutely. I mean, that that was always my workflow. I never used the plugin, even though I've had it for years. I always went into the studio, but but now I'll, I'm just going to stay in Logic. I've been doing it. I've been using the beta and, um, you know, and, and it transfers all at once. All you have to do is push play for like uh, one second and all the audio is in there. Oh, so you don't cool. have to do the whole you know, export each thing separately and, and it saves within the project folder so you can move it around to another computer and you don't lose all the Melodyne, you know, Very files cool. and all yeah, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's so. great. All right, so we've got our five vocal takes in. We just took the mouse and we swiped across take one for the first line. We swiped across take two for the second line, three for the third, whatever. I don't know why they all magically lined up perfectly yeah. like that. but And then it just automatically puts those up in the comp track and crossfades them from one to the other so we don't have to kind of do all that afterwards. Yep. Um, yep. Where, where, uh, just, just generally describe where that Melodyne is applied or where we're sort of pulling that up and tuning the vocal on one of, you know, we, let's say we had to just yeah. tune the third line there. Yeah. I mean, full disclosure, what you were just saying, I'm so used to the studio version and, you know, sometimes you get, you know, Melodyne, uh, projects with 80 vocals, 40 vocals. And, you know, it's nice to be in your own DAW. So my process at this point is usually I bring up Melodyne during comping situation because um, what we were just talking about is being able to fix things while you're deciding which take was better. It's Mm -hmm. just a whole nother approach and and way better. Um, And then when that's done and then basically everything's comped, I love the comp. Um, if it's only a couple of vocals, I'll stay in the DAW and just do all the Melodyne detail work in in Logic. But usually, or Pro Tools, whatever. Usually, I'm going to export still if it's you know most of my songs have 20 vocals at least. So right. then, you know, you can do all this in the plugin version now. But I really, it, it's a whole different story when you can you know let's say teen, uh, tune the lead, and you're doing a double. You get the lead perfect timing, pitch, everything's perfect, and then to be able to see that in gray and then. Yeah 
start working on the second one. And as you do harmonies, just to really be able to time it up and get that, that, um, that super modern pop. I mean, a secret, a lot of people don't understand, I think is a lot of these, a lot of the, the modern pop stuff, you'll, you'll have a lead vocal, they'll sing it through and then they'll, aside from the harmonies that are going to make the record, they'll do all these harmonies in the studio. And then someone will go into Melodyne and line them up so perfectly, all the S's and T's and P's and every word's exactly the same. And then they, they'll tuck three or four of those harmonies way down in the lead vocal. So uh, Justin Timberlake's a great example. He has so many overtones in his records coming out of his voice. You're like, is that possible? Is that humanly possible? Yeah. Some of that is tucked down harmonies that are so well lined up that you can't tell they're different from the lead. You know, that's so cool, man. And I love hearing you describe that like that. And I, and it's great to get like, kind of get that insight because sometimes we, we sense it on the, the final mix, but you can't, it's like, you can't know exactly what's happening there. You just know that it sounds better than what you're doing, you know? Yeah. And and so to get that that you know peek behind the curtain and know that there's all these stacks of things happening that are tucked in and blended so that they don't so that you don't ever hear them stick out you really just always focused as if it was a lead vocal that's definitely yeah. a cool thing that Melodyne will let you do because you can manipulate anything yeah and you can just you can perfect it to the point I mean you can spend eighty hours on on one vocal if you want because you can just keep going and cutting it up into smaller and smaller pieces and really re- rebuild stuff. Yeah. Um, another, another funny secret, I, I, I'm not going to mention any names, but, um, I know this big vocal producer worked with a lot of big people and he was telling me that he's definitely been on sessions where like, you'll be expecting like w- a certain artist and then somebody of a totally different race will, you know, in, in age and everything will walk in and they sound just like that artist and they literally are singing for the artist. That broke my heart. I never heard of that until oh, about in a studio? six months ago in the studio. Oh, so my goodness. I'm not going to name any names because that would be NDA uh, nightmare. Yeah, we don't but, need to uh, talk about Millie Vanilli. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. But no, having, just yeah, kidding. just like that situation, but like in, like reference vocals, reference vocalists, you know, there are full-time Beyonce reference vocalists in this world that know how to sing like her and right. that's their job and they're amazing at it. You know, not her. My God, not her. She's, right. I'm not, so, <laughs> not But her. no, on a certain level, especially but, um, when you get into the live production, I, I learned that, you know, at some point about... When you have these huge productions on stage, you've got a an artist who has to sing this lead vocal that's intense like yeah. the record, but they also have to yeah. dance all over the place. Exactly. And so you you have to have somebody else who sings along with them and like supports their voice and just yep. keeps that vocal sounding right on. Yeah. Or takes over when they have to do a big dance and they'll mute it for thirteen seconds and come back so the artist can say, What well, hello, Seattle, you know. Right. That's oh, a yeah. trip, man. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, cool. So uh, let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. So Rockstars, if you haven't used something like Melodyne, Melodyne is the one where you've got these blobs, uh, that represent your vocal notes and you can move them up and down in pitch. You can stretch them out. You can, you know, make it change the timing. You can kind of go in and find different syllables. Um, let's talk about some of these specifics and I'll, I'll ask the questions from the things that I'm used to doing and maybe Great. find challenging and you might have some tips. So for example, you've got the, um, it's nice that now they've got some color variation. So it used to be that your lead vocal and the double of that lead vocal, like every every vocal that was in your Melodyne studio session was the same color. And I think now you've got like the one you're working on is colored, but the ones that you're not yeah. working on are grayed out. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> so that's yeah. helpful because then you can sort of see what's what. Um, are there some tricks for dividing up the syllables in a word and moving the different parts of the word around so that they sort of line up with your double? Yeah. um, Usually I end up doing most of the the timing manually, even though there are some tricks. It's just such a, you know, timing is easily the most time consuming and hard, most difficult part of melodyming Mm -hmm. because it's so subjective. And like, how do you make someone that's rushing just a little bit and there's six words involved, you have to nudge them all just right. So it still sounds human, you know? Um, but uh, there are some tricks um, you can use. It's c- kind of like a side chain where you can be tuning one vocal and then do a key input on the side for quantize. If you go to, to the quantize macro, mm-hmm. um, then you can, uh, you can make another vocal as your key input. So it'll look for transients and try to line it up. So it's um, almost like instead of 
the the bar bar and beat grid being the grid for quantizing the vocal it's using a different track to quantize exactly the vocal. exactly and that works pretty well if you've got like you know pretty percussive stuff like i i use that in with rap a lot because if it's if it's a lot of percussion and then sometimes it can just it's kind of like vocal line it, it can mm -hmm. totally line it up i won't say it's as good as vocal line when it comes to that specific thing but it can help um i mean that that's a huge part of my process too a lot of times i'll take you know if i've got four leads and 16 harmonies on, on a record i'll take the leads in i'll time them tune them perfect them then i'll go back into logic and then i'll use vocal line vocal line to line up the harmonies and doubles as much as i can with vocal line if i need to save time because the lining up of stuff is what takes so long yeah um so sometimes i'll take that shortcut i, I didn't really ever do that once until about a year ago and people all over the industry do it every day and I kind of like, I guess I, you know, was like, well, it's not going to be as good. And now I'm just like, well, it's not supposed to be perfect anyways. So right. um, I kind of like, I put it on moderate and at least gets me close enough. And then I can tweak as I'm in there. Um, well, I feel like that's one of the I'm things sure I learned <laughs> from, from some of the professionals I've known um, tuning vocals is sometimes, you know, I think when you're looking at it at first and you're like, oh, should I use auto tune or should I use Melodyne? And then you run into somebody like, oh, no, of course I've got both. You know, you just... Some mm -hmm. things, some each tool might do a different thing pretty well, and your skill set is to learn, you know, to have them all and use each yeah. one for whatever it's great at, and go to the next one for whatever it needs. Absolutely, um, I use them all in tandem as a vocal producer. Uh, you know, Melodyne takes the auto out of Auto Tune, mm -hmm. but Melodyne Auto Tune spends a lot of its algorithm um, on detecting non-pitched information. So that's S's and T's and breaths and all the things that don't have a squiggly line. If you look in, you know, a blob has a squiggly line where that is, is where there's actual pitch. Everything else is percussion and non-pitched information. You can't really touch that in melanine. Right. If you try and tune an S, it sounds robotic. And 90% of the time when someone says melanine sounds really bad, it's like, well, I promise this is what you're doing. Right. This is what you, and I, I, um, We've actually asked Peter Neubacher, the uh, mm -hmm. the genius that makes yeah. that makes melanine. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to learn about music's role on this in this universe, watch that thirty minute documentary of the guy who created uh, melodyne. It, it'll blow your mind. I've watched it like eight times. It's just you know a lot of great quotes and stuff. Um, Very cool. But yeah, so um, AutoTune uses a lot of its algorithm to in real time, you know, with a what ten millisecond buffer. It has to decide what is pitch and what's not. So it uses a lot of its algorithm to do that, which it does it amazingly in real time. It's incredible. Melodyne, you have to push stop. So you don't tune the S's and T's, but then the algorithm is way more complicated when it comes to the actual pitching and tuning and timing. So, you know, that's why why it sounds so good. Yeah. Well, and Melodyne so, allows you to to manipulate things so well. And I, I find once I got into yeah. the studio version of it, the reason I like using studio is because I can fly around. Because yeah. like once you learn how to navigate in it, you've got all your vocals that you're working on all together. You can hear yeah. the harmonies happen as they're happening. You can turn them on, turn them off. And I'm I'm still using a little bit of an older version, so I don't I'm not hip to all the newest stuff that's come along. But mm -hmm. um, but it's that's the part that I found really useful is hearing things and being able to tell. Um, sometimes I found also that I it wasn't until I got it these vocals back into the mix that, that certain things yeah, were really highlighted. Totally. Too. So that's a little tricky. And I think that's, what's cool about using the plugin is if you're doing a bunch of additional um, treatment of compression and things like that, you're mm -hmm. going to hear all that effect when you're manipulating totally. the plugin and you might like, it might really highlight timing issues that are hidden. If you're just listening without all the extra compression. Now what's crazy about um, exactly what you just said now the plugin version, the new version that's coming out, I'm not sure when it hits. It's any time now. <laughs> I'm not going to officially say anything, but no um, uh, it, um, it, the plugin version, you literally can full screen your Melodyne any instance. Let's say you have it on 30 tracks in Pro Tools. You can open, or right, let's talk about Logic because it's integrated now. Yeah, you can open one of them, and all of them are there. So you can full screen it, and it literally feels exactly like the doll. They even oh, gave that's great. Apple even gave um, Solidity permission to take over the key commands when it's up front. Uh, so Melodyne cool. key co key commands work now full on, just like Studio. When it's up front, when you close the window, you go back to the logic key command. So um, it is kind of 
merging those worlds. And I think I'm just, you know, a, an old mule kind of, you know, I really should just be not using the studio at uh, all. <laughs> well, it's all right. I mean, that's part but, of what, uh, you know, I think that's yeah. part of what we do as professionals or, you know, as, as users is like, once you learn how to use a tool, the more valuable yeah. thing is your ability to use it well, then like, it, it's even better to have something with less features that you just simply are quick on Absolutely. than to have the newest features. So it, that's why it takes us a minute to switch over to the new thing. Um, so no worries, but that's really exciting. And, and I will definitely be excited to be getting into mm -hmm. that. Um, I have some questions about logic I want to ask you, and then I want to ask you more questions about Melodyne. Um, cause you, you brought up key commands and key commands are an important part of my workflow. I've learned that, uh, I use a trackball. So the less I can take my hand off the trackball or the less mouse yeah. movement stuff I have to do and the more quick keys I can do, the faster I work. Mm -hmm. So what are some uh, key commands as far as navigating in logic that you think you use a lot? Um, can, do uh, I, I still don't even know the key commands for basic things like zooming in and out and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, now with the, the trackpads, it's kind of, you know, I use right. a laptop, so zooming is a lot easier because of that. But, um, you know, um, I actually for years used, when I first switched over from Pro Tools, I, you know, geeked out a little bit and um, made a key, most of my key commands in Logic feel like Pro Tools because I was like mainly in Pro Tools. And I kind of got used to that, you know, like command brackets with zoom in and out horizontally, right, totally. which on Logic, it's command right and left. So when I started teaching, I would get on, you know, students' machines and be like, oh my God, I feel naked. Like, I don't know any com right. key commands on, on your machine. And, uh, you know, that takes away 70% of your speed. So um, I went back to defaults recently Um you know, so obviously command up, down, right, left. Uh, one that's really important that I, I didn't use enough in, in the past um, is command U. Basically, uh, command U, um, I forget what it is. Actually, it basically puts the bracket, brackets, um, the loop right around the, whatever region you have selected. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if that's a default one or one you have to plan, but that's kind of like in like Ableton when you, if you, you can select the region and push play and no matter what, you know, it's going to loop whatever you just highlighted. Oh, um, cool. you know, so you just add that and then it, it helps it feel more like, a like, you know, in the last, God, in the, the last three updates to logic have been huge where it's starting to feel a lot more like Ableton when it comes to production production, because now when you drag any audio in the world, wave AIF MP3s, you can have it do what. Ableton does and warp it and put all your warp markers and stretch it and quantize it if you want. That's so cool. all your samples, um, you know, and then, and then you can do pitch now like in Ableton. So, um, so, so you have yeah. experience in different DAWs. Maybe you can talk a little bit about just like, what tips do you have for us as far as that huge challenge of making the transition? Cause I totally experienced that thing you described where you're like, I know how to do this in Pro Tools. I go to Logic and I'm on a different one and I feel like I'm back in kindergarten and I don't know, I know the, it's the English worst. language. So how, so how did you get <laughs> past those barriers? What are some tips for that that challenge? Yeah, when you when you uh when you don't have your tools, it it is amazing how suddenly you just kind of like panic. Um Yeah. You know, it's, and it always happens on like big sessions. Uh the <laughs> first time I worked with a big artist it was BB King and Suddenly, I walk in and digital performer is up on the screen, and I had no idea. I, I didn't oh, even know what it was man. at the time, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> um, anyway, so you made it through. Um, I'd say, uh, for me, you know, it started out as as an artist, and that's really all I really. That's what I care about is making music, being an artist. But all these tools are like new instruments to me, so I've just gotten really into engineering and producing because you know it helps you get what's in your head out as clear as possible. Um, the, the more, if you understand a tool, then it's, it doesn't matter what DAW. It's like, if you know, uh, an SSL through and out, you can learn Neve pretty easily because you know, the concepts, you know, if you right, understand the right. concepts. So that's one of those things, you know, I think I learned a lot doing live sound. Like I've, since I moved to LA in four and a half years, four years, I've done over 500 live sound gigs, you know? So I'm constantly having to just like walk up to a new board and be like, Oh my God, what is this? You, oh, you need to know where you're your uh, routing is where you're how to send to buses, how to do delay sends and returns, um, how to engage inserts. Yeah. And once you're there, you're, like, you're pretty, pretty much know any board. If you know those things, same with the dolls. Like once you get routing, I would start, I mean, routing is everything. You start with routing. Um, just like they say, signal flow is, you know, the first thing you think about anytime there's a, a problem. 
Um, Ableton was hard for me, actually, because I, I went from Pro Tools to Logic pretty easily. It's just learning new key commands. Logic has a lot more bells and whistles than, than Pro Tools. Pro Tools feels more like a board, you know, right. to me. Um, but Pro Tools has a lot just, of preferences like hidden that will do yeah, yeah. some fancy stuff that you don't even exactly. need to think about until you're getting into advanced levels, you know? Exactly. Um, yeah, I, you know, of, funny thing about Ableton yeah. is, uh, and I don't yeah. know if you can, if, uh, if you experienced any of this too, but at first I was like trying to wrap my brain around it and I was frustrated. And then one day I, a friend came over and we were drinking and all of a sudden I was, I was a bit drunk, you know, and he was just mm -hmm. like, can you do this? Can you do that? And I, and I was like flowing right through it and I was making beats and made a song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, have you ever experienced that where it's like, Almost like drinking a little bit just kind of turns your brain off and you quit worrying get about out of it your and just own relax way. into it. Yeah. Get it get out of your own way, right? You know, that's a, that's why I force myself to to perform through my whole my whole life. It's just like you you get out of your own way when the, when it's on and the adrenaline's running. It's amazing how much better you are when you're on the spot. Yeah. It's, you know, and now that's not the only way to make music though. It's not, yo, he he made that beat in ten minutes. He's a genius. It's like, well, you get Picasso ten minutes, he's gonna do something amazing, but give them 10 hours, it might be more amazing, you know? So I, I don't really adhere to the whole, like this is the quicker, the better, but, yeah. um, yeah, Ableton was really, really weird for me because it felt like I had to like, I was thinking in this horizontal way where like you go left right, and right tracks. and that's time. And that's what time, like it almost, it's like you have to like forget about time for a second that it's even a variable in any of this music stuff and think of it as loops. Because once you understand the clip view, then you're going to understand the arrangement view, um, just like in you know any DAW. But the clip view is like really interesting. That it's it's like it's like NPC people get it in a heartbeat because they're used to thinking in loops. Mm -hmm. And like once something's going, and I mean I, I like to produce in Ableton when I can because like the the beat never stops, especially yeah. if you're doing like EDM. You can just keep looping and looping and looping, and it's so easy to have things trigger correctly that. It's almost like you space out and then suddenly you're done with the song. So yeah. I see why Ableton's really inspiring. Now the problem with Ableton, and I didn't, yeah, I didn't realize this for a long time. You, like, I couldn't do a pro mix in Ableton if it was over 40 tracks because you can't see more than one at a time. It's like a live sound digital board. You have to select the track and then you see your whole channel strip. Ableton, you can't zoom out and see 200 tracks at once with all your plugins. You only see one at a one, and so. Good luck doing a huge mix, but I, I I hear rumors that they're they're working on uh you know all dolls are gonna be like do everything FL Studio the new one is like yeah. getting crazy. I know? got a lot of kids. Um, cool. I'm I'm working with kids in the city here, and a lot of them are doing hip hop and stuff, and they all use FL Studio. Yeah. I, I yeah. suspect that it's partly because they're finding <laughs> cracked versions for a, for yes. a Windows yes. computer or something, <laughs> which you know well that's fine. That's for people. People got to get into music some way. Although I certainly yeah. don't don't endorse that. Um, nope. I, I I was very proud of myself at the moment in time where I was like, "Holy shit! I've got three computers and none of them have cracked anything Cracks, on I them." I know. I know. I mean, well, the thing is, you like I don't know what I would have done without some of them at the beginning, just learning how to do things. But at some point, you get busy enough, and the clients, the 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 gigs are important enough. That you you need two things. You need to know your tools work, and B, if something does go wrong in a big session and someone's dropping five grand on a you know a eight hour day, and you're having problems and it turns out to be because of a crack in your machine, like you can end up having to pay for that studio time. And yeah. I do know people that have had you know waves walk in and, but I, I I've gone through a thing right now. Um, yeah, at this point, everything I, I use, I own. I, there's three compressors I love in the world, so I don't need 800. But right. it took a while for me to know which ones those were. Uh, but recently, I had my sent my computer into Apple. Hard drive had to be replaced, wiped it. And because of the High Sierra upgrade, I had to do it because of NAM and Melodyne. Um, my clones, for some reason, cloning back to an a AFS, the new file system, instead of Mac in a journal, it's like Apple file system now, it won't clone back. So I've actually, for the first time in a decade, for the last month, been installing programs. Yeah. For the, you know, I've never Not had to clean fun. it out. But last I time I had to redo that my... I haven't used in years. Yeah, yeah. Last, <laughs> I <was> like, oh. <laughs> last time I installed reinstalled everything on my studio computer, I had to start from scratch. 
And it literally took me a week of installing programs oh. before I finally was up and running with everything. Absolutely. So I totally it's understand that. But the I will, last last comment about cracks is I think the other thing that happens is you begin to meet the people who make the tools that you yes. use, and you realize you're like, holy shit, these are all real people just like me yes. who are really working Absolutely. as hard as I am to try and make great music and and help us make great records. So that was great a real eye opener for point. me. You know. Yeah, it's so true. You go to a place like Nam, you see these these people that are so so passionate about basically providing us with the gear we need to make the art that makes this planet move, you know? Yeah. Um, they are that passionate about that, that goal to give us the best tools to make the best art. It's really awesome. And I love, I love the trade shows. It's just like a big, like nerd family. It's great. <laughs> totally, man. <laughs> All right. So let me go back to Melodyne for a sec. Here's a thing that I find myself doing that is one of the challenges. I have one vocal line that slides from one note down to another, and now I'm trying to match on the double, I either tune the vocal so that the slide is right or match it. Um, what are some things that you might do? What advice do you have about um, a controlling or manipulating the slide between notes so that it totally. doesn't, you don't get something weird? Absolutely. You know, obviously a huge part of, of Melodyne is uh, transitions between notes, obviously. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean that that's always a, a tough one. Um, but there are definitely some tricks. So uh first of all, you have your there's a difference between your um uh pitch modulation and pitch drift tools. There's two different ones. I'm not yeah. sure if you know the difference, but right under if you click and hold on the um pitch tool, then there's two that come down. The pitch modulation tool is the one that basically gets rid of vibrato or mm -hmm. increases. So just the just the uh, volume side of things um, uh, and, and the pitch just, just vibrato, right? Yeah. And, then, and then there's pitch drift, which within a given blob, blob from the beginning to the end, it basically takes the average of the whole thing and tries to smooth it out um, almost like uh, if you're trying to tune a room and you're removing the bad frequencies and boosting the ones that are being canceled out to get an even – flat situation at the end. Um, right. Well, it's so, kind of like, it's kind of like, um, you know, if, if you're holding a long note, there might be vibrato going up and down, but at the beginning you might kind of go a little flat on the note and near the end, you might go a little sharp on the note, even with that vibrato in there. And, and I feel exactly. like the pitch drift kind of brings up the flat towards the note, brings the sharp back down towards the yeah. note as well. Absolutely. It's kind of the balance balances the whole ship, you know? So those are two tools. Now I will go on and say that I, I barely ever, ever, ever use pitch modulation anymore. And I know a lot of Melodyne engineers that rarely go for it because obviously a lot of the emotional delivery of a vocal is in the vibrato. You right. know, so I prefer, so let's go back to the, you know, two notes uh, sloping down to the next note. And then you're trying to double that. Um, first of all, obviously line the notes up. Uh, if you hold down option at any point near the end of a blob, near any either the beginning or in edge it'll let you basically grab the timing tool and be free with it so hold down option at the edge and then you that's basically how you can move the timing um get those perfectly and then you can use so any of the pitch tools if you go to them you bring up these little yellow transition lines mm -hmm. it's like a little handle that lets you either smooth it out so it's like a smooth transition between notes. Or if you go all the way the other direction, it sounds like auto-tune where it's just, you know, perpendicular from one note to the next, mm -hmm. you know, unnatural. So you match that as close as you can, get the blob at the beginning and the end of the next note about the same, match it, and then I will start cutting it up. Okay. So cool. take the non-pitched information, so or, or the slope down, the big long slope, slope down, make sure you have... You know, the previous note and the note you want to go to, cut it where you want that to be perfectly in tune, beginning and end, and then cut it up and then start just massaging the note separations and, you know, option grab a, 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 a blob to move it up and down and just kind of start visualizing it and massaging it. Eventually, it'll get there and it'll sound great. <laughs> so <laughs> that's sort of why like, Mel and I take so long long to do. Right, because so you so many little things you can do. So, yeah. so I, I, if I'm visualizing this right, it, it, you'd have this, uh, the first note is at one pitch and the second note is at a lower pitch. And we're talking about the sloping transition between, you know, like, ah, uh, kind of, how'd you like that? Uh, yeah, so that we're great. talking about the, uh, <laughs> the slope down from one note to the other. 
So you would you did all these things initially to get it pretty good with sort of the um, the pitch tools and the the pitch handle tool for the smooth transition, but then you might um, do the note separation tool and chop the beginning of where it starts sliding down and chop the beginning of the lower note mm-hmm. where the slide is finished sliding, and then yep. w- and then sometimes I find myself sort of chopping up that slide note into a few different segments so exactly. that I can kind of move them up and down a little bit, and you see the pitch line going through there and you're just sort of shoving the pitch line around yeah. a little bit that way. And then you use the pitch drift tool on each one of those, like let's call them steps. Let's say you you take that that slope and cut it into five pieces. Then you have five little steps, right? Well, each one of those steps can be kind of close to where the, the original take is, but then you can take the pitch drift tool and make it more of a slope or less per step. So you can really, if someone has like a, uh, and they do like a little, you know, vocal little tar- trill or Tarzan mistake. of the jungle thing. Yeah, there. exactly. <laughs> so you could literally take that, cut that out, bring it down, and then ma- massage the handles for the transition and the pitch drift within the body of the of the note. Yeah. And then you know you can really massage it, you know, all the way down. A lot of so. massaging going on. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, one of the things that pops into my mind too is. Uh, a very cool aspect of learning how to use Melodyne and tuning vocals, um, and this reminds me, I, I did an interview with Ryan Hewitt, and he was talking about the power of like learning piano, and all of a sudden you have this understanding of harmony on the music you're producing. Yeah. For me, Melodyne and learning how to use that gave me a huge amount of insight into understanding pitch of vocals. and Absolutely. And like you discover, you're like, you discover all these places that the vocal is going that are totally not in the key or like hitting the wrong notes and stuff like that, that you might've yeah. just kind of blown off before or not, not even paid attention to. Absolutely. No, I, I, um, I took one vocal lesson in my life, um, just to learn how to breathe, but the rest I learned through Melodyne. Um, even my music theory, so much of it, because if you spend a lot of time in a certain key, Thinking about those notes, then eventually you you start to realize, wait, I know seven keys in my head just because I've spent hundreds of hours tuning in that key for this one song or something. So yeah, Melodyne is an amazing teaching tool. And it's not just for vocals. I literally, I see it as a magic wand. You know, we haven't even gotten into the new stuff like the harmonics for the first time in history. We can touch all the partials up to like the 400th partial of any sound. We'll get into that stuff later. It's insane. It's all about massaging and touching. I know, I, you know, I do have I do have a hard time teaching audio without um, a lot of that's what she said. Like every every, every line is that's what she said. <laughs> There's a lot of ins and outs and stuff, you know. So, anyways. Oh man, what about what about the ladies so, yeah, in your class? What about the ladies in your class? Did they make that's what well, he, that's what he said jokes? This yeah, totally. But this month we are super naughty. There's only guys in this class for the first time in in a long time. So it's like you know, a frat boy. Um, we're all frat boys in, in this class um, this week. <laughs> do you, so, okay. Interesting. Um, as a teacher in your teaching experience, do you have any comments you want to share about women in recording and, and what you're seeing happen through the school system or any encouragements? Yeah, that's, that's, it's so interesting to me because some of the best engineers I know in the world are, are females. I think it's kind of like with, with STEM in school, you know, with science and engineering and math technology, a lot of times it's just like, women are discouraged even though they are so good at it. like Emily uh, Lazard, you know, the mastering engineer, uh, um, not yet. No, out of, out of the lodge. She, she works out of the lodge in, in New York and she's just one of the best mastering engineers, Foo Fighters last record and just so many amazing records. You meet her and she's just, you know, everything you'd expect from a, a genius engineer. Um, I do see in the schools here, usually the, the girls that, that come to like, you know, this is, you know, one of the top audio colleges in the nation they come here because they know, they know what they want. You know, they get here and they are rock stars at this school. You know, Uh, I've got a girl in my class right now. She's, she's running lights right now and she didn't know how to do lights. It's a big, you know, Martin board with, you know, it's lights are a whole different story. She read the manual during after class one day and now she's running it for the show tonight, you know, and she also plays bass and guitar and drums and engineers. And so, um, I do, it, it is a lot heavier on the, you know, male enrollment, but, um, I feel like, but uh, half the guys like don't know what they're there for. <laughs> exactly, we need to really encourage it because, um, and we, all, all the women out there, if you are great at what you do, 
you're also beautiful and you have a leg up, I swear to God, on all of us men. So don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Well, I've had some uh, really inspiring women on the podcast and I'm excited to have more. So I'm always, uh, I'm always happy to learn about new engineers, producers, anybody who's doing some cool stuff out there. Um, yeah. All right. Well, let's see. I want to ask you, what do, what do I want to ask you? What, what's some other vocal tuning challenges that I have? Um, I, I, again, the newer version may have features that are different, you know, have are solutions to the older version. But sometimes I found that like copying and pasting a section within Melodyne could have a few challenges to it. Uh, is there anything yeah. you want to share about like smart ways to do that? Is the new version um, allowing it to be easier to do? Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in the past it, it has, I mean, it's always been one of the banes of my existence. I've, I'm like, I know this program so well. Why can't I just copy and paste something again after I've been through this 50 times? You know, it always seemed a little difficult. I did find one secret is that um, use control click instead of right click when you are a copy and pasting. It seems to work better. I don't know why. Okay. It sounds like a bug to me. But yes, the uh, when you say, is it fixed? Um, now it's a whole different story uh, with the plugin version, Logic Studio One, and uh, maybe more companies to come. We'll we'll talk about it. Um, <laughs> uh, they now because it's all being rendered and analyzed in the background constantly. Now you can actually move your blobs or, or your regions around in Logic at will, and it moves all the Melodyne with it. So you oh, can copy great. and paste. That, that changes everything. Obviously, that's. Ugh. That was always a nightmare to be like, to tune one thing and then you realize you can't tune the other. You're hearing the original of the other or blah, blah, blah. It just got really complicated. Well, there were, but now it's it's going to be all free. There were so many times where I had already copied and pasted in Pro Tools and now it was in Logic and I was like, yeah. I'll just tune it again. You know, and that's like, to yeah. keep tuning the same section over over and over. As uh, I mean, I said Logic, I meant Melodyne, sorry. I kept yeah. tuning the same section over and over again. Um, and and uh, it, I... It's cool to hear that now it's paired up with the DAW for the navigational aspects because uh, within Melodyne, the blob architecture is very cool in terms of, you know, getting you away from thinking about too much tech and just kind of, mm. you know, conceptualize it uh, or abstract it a little more. But there are all these times where you're like, no, I want this to be exactly here at this point on this yeah. part, at this point of the song. So, and that was a little totally. challenging for me here and there. Well, so totally. let's... um. Let's take a break for a sec. We'll, we'll uh, for the jam session. We'll come back in. I'm going to hit you up with more questions about Melodyne and um, producing beats and stuff like that. Rockstars, uh, you can find links to stuff we're talking about, including a YouTube playlist that I put together for Derek in the show notes. If you're on your mobile device, just click right through and you should see it. Uh, you can go to, the, to rsrockstars.com, the website, use the magnifying glass and just search Derek. That'll take you right to the blog post where we've got the YouTube um, play window and you can kind of watch some of these videos. And then uh, just a reminder too, that if you are interested in learning more about mixing in your DAW, I have a free mix training at mixmasterbundle.com. And that link is also in the show notes. Um, and I just show you how to mix using free plugins in any DAW and uh, and you get to download my multi-tracks and, and play around with it and have some fun. So we'll see you in just a minute for the jam session. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Supa Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299 or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Hey, rock stars. It's Lid Sean. We're jumping back in for the jam session. My guest today is Derek Olds, joining us from Los Angeles um, from the theater. What is it? It was the um, 
uh, Ivar the Theaters, I- right? Am I saying yeah, that right? Ivar. The Ivar. Yeah, I V A R. Yeah. Okay, cool, man. And you were saying that uh, during the break, you you walked downstairs to check out what was going on, and there was like a what a twenty five piece band <laughs> showing up yeah. or something like that. Yeah, we we do a monthly show the last Thursday uh, of of every month with the whole school, and you know the the students perform, and, and my class runs sound and production and all that stuff. Um, today's rehearsal, and one of the acts was like, "Yeah, we're gonna bring a band." I'm like, yeah, bring anything. We got plenty of stage and mics and all that stuff. They walk in with a 25 piece <laughs> marching band. They told us a band. That's, That's hilarious. <laughs> That's awesome. I was thinking drums, bass, keys. Have you, you recorded know. a 25 piece hey, marching band before? I have. I have. Um, went back to my high school for one of the songs on my upcoming record. It's called um, Are You Ready? Uh, it has uh, like a, it's about a 20 piece marching band. I went back to my high school and recorded that and another song for another artist. It was so much fun, you know. To go That's back and put awesome. a bunch of mics up, and uh, maybe well, let's take a moment and and just uh, tell us a little bit more about your upcoming record, and you know, share any story around that if you want. Yeah, it's um, it's not. It's, I guess it's not an unlikely story where, pretty much after almost a decade of working on whatever it was going to be, here we are. Um, basically, it's uh, ten songs. I've been working on some of them. The one I'm finishing this week was my first Logic session ever about 10 years ago. And, wow. um, <laughs> is and it I'm actually finishing... the same like iterations of logic session? Is it in the same folder or has it oh, completely been moved yes. to a new thing? No, I'm, I'm a big, huge uh, proponent of save as. So I'm on save as number 310 on this project. Wow. But pretty much every time I open a song to work on it or make a significant, significant big change, I do a save as, and it saves me over 10 years in logic on one session. I mean, it's, it's just helped me so many times bring things in from the past or, you know, things that got erased. Um, but yeah, I mean, so. Well, well hold up before, uh, before you go on, um, yeah. just explain briefly, explain the, the saving architecture of a logic session, that folder, yeah. like for those of us who haven't used logic yet, what are some of the features in that, that we need to Perfect. know yeah. about? Yeah, and I would say you know Pro Tools and Logic are pretty much the same in this in this respect. So, when you first save a session, of course, it makes um, it gives you in Logic it gives you either I think it's called a, a folder or a package. Um, mm-hmm. Package is really for people that like it's like they don't let you see into the the folder, so you can't see the audio files or the bounces and all that kind of stuff. Always choose folder, <laughs> be a pro. Right. All right. So, and then it'll ask you what do you want to include. I recommend just check every single box every time because if you don't have a movie in your session, it won't make the folder. But if you happen to, you know, do that. So then it makes an audio files folder, a um, uh, a bounces folder, fade files folder if it needs it, different sampler instruments, you know, all kinds of stuff. But one, th- but it makes your first project folder, project file. So you have your session folder, your project file. The project file file is like a snapshot of where the session is at. So. I'll, so, so project file is a, like a Pro Tools session file. It's the same concept. Yes, exactly. Same exact thing. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's say someone sends me some, uh, a project to mix. Before I even open their project file, I make a copy and name it Space 2. And then name the first one Space 1. And then from then on out, just go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way. Um, so first of all, I can tell them I never even opened the one you sent me. So if you're saying something is missing that was there, we can open the original that I never even opened. So that it helps in that situation when you're, you've probably been there when someone's like, yeah. Oh, we're missing a synth. Oh, Why'd totally. you take it out? I was like, well, it I, wasn't I just, there. You know? I just about printed the mix and they're like, Oh, it's totally the, that guitar is not there. And, and then you find exactly. out it's like the featured guitar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and then anytime I make a significant change, I'll just do another five, six, seven, eight, in, in Pro Tools or Logic, you can go into old sessions or other sessions and import tracks. So if you just yeah. completely ruin something or have a bug, you know, if you have something go corrupt, like literally a corrupt file, it's really nice to have those save as is, you know, so. Yeah. Um, well, you so know, yeah, I'm just <laughs> I was going to say one of the things I might do is uh, if we're revisiting a song each day on a session, I might make a new one as we revisit it, or if we're about to do guitars, I'll call it guitar. The challenge with that sometimes is, and I like your numbering system, is because I think we're about to do a guitar, but then we end up doing like tambourine and background yeah. vocals, and then at this, the name doesn't match it. I sort of wish that um, 
that it was built into some of these that when you double clicked and opened the session, it immediately asked you if you want to open that one or do a save as. Yeah. Just knowing that you're revisiting it, you know? It totally should. Um, Absolutely. I mean, Logic has this new, uh, I think they're called um, alternatives or something like that, where it kind of like saves constantly. That is one thing I will say about Logic X. Ever since they went to X, you know, I still get crashes like every other engineer in the world, but I have not lost one moment of work since Logic X. When it crashes, you're, you freak out every time, even though you trust it, you don't, you know, and then it comes back up because Logic put, uh, someone at Apple, um, explained to me that most programs, when a crash happens, whatever the last thing that happened was, is going to be lost because the crash happened before it could, it could render it. Logic is before that it works with the CPU. So when it crashes, it actually grabs that last thing. Very cool. You know, and and I've seen it work, you know, a lot. So, um, so quick question. Yeah. Um, in some programs like uh, PreSona Studio One, for example, I've noticed they might have a save, uh, maybe a save as, and then also there's like versions. Is Does Logic do versions as well or just yeah. the save as feature? Yeah, that's that. I think they call it um, alternatives uh, in Logic. It might be called versions too. But yeah, it's, it's like that where it's, I think they started because of the whole, saving something as a package instead of a folder, you still wanted save as is. So within that uh, package, you can do versions and alternatives. So it's if you're if you're still doing um I just really like to have access. I mean, I'm in the audio files folder and the bounces folder all the time, you yeah, know, during a project. Yeah. So you don't want to have to like go to package contents every time and stuff. Um but yeah, so save as is have been somehow this song that I'm finishing right now has got like 210 tracks. It's a it's a, a song called Woman. I might have sent it to you. It's a big rock anthem that I said, if, if the members of Led Zeppelin were my age with my tools today, what would they make? Nice, and that's, dude. Awesome. That, that, was, that was my whole thing. And I, I wrote a song called Woman. And um, it was the first thing I ever recorded in Logic 10 years ago. And it's just, you know how it is. If you don't release something, then six months later, you're six months better. So then yeah. you're going to, if you know how to fix something and you hear it in your own music, you're going to be compelled to fix it. Um and now that's another reason why I started teaching because I knew there were certain things I I knew the names of the things that I didn't I could not figure out. Like I knew what I didn't know and I knew that being in an academic situation like like um like phasing. Just right. really understanding phasing is like like the last frontiers for mixing engineers you, you know phasing low end management it it's you have to know your meters. Like you have to know meters to really kill the low end uh, on every on every record. Um mm-hmm. You know, so there were a few things that, uh, you know, I would fix. Inter, inter, inter sample peaking, I didn't know about that. And it ruined every record for the first half of my <laughs> career. <laughs> like, just no, I didn't understand that if you, you know, if you're in the digital world and you're using, you know, 16 bits to recreate a, a, a curve, you know, let's say on the positive curve of a wave form, if you, if you limit all the way up to zero, when it recreates that waveform, it's a, it's, it's a step. So when it recreates it, the tip of that waveform actually goes above zero and arcs back down. So if you have like cheap speakers, it's going to distort, even though in the studio, it sounds great. Yeah. It's only, only when you export, you know, that was a huge thing. So over time I got, you know, just about a year ago, I got to a point where I, I was thought I was competing truly with my idols and my, my mentors and stuff. So I was like, all right, now, now I can finish. And so now I'm just in the final mastering stage on, on most of them, I'm going to release an EP first and um, go on, you know, tour and do the whole fun thing. I'm doing a, a, a lot of looping on stage and stuff so I can keep producing, but on stage. <laughs> what uh, What are some tools you know? you'll use for stage looping? Great. Um, so I use a combination of Ableton um, and I, I, I recently got the uh, TC Helicon Voice Live 3 Extreme. Um, I used the version 2 before that, but... It's amazing. Like it, it kind of replaces a lot of my pedal board. I'll use Ableton to, you know, let's say I do a song in the studio. I limit myself to 12 stems at the end, mm-hmm. you know, for many reasons for, you know, summing out and, you know, out of, out of the box and things like that. But I keep it at 12. So with a 16 channel mixer anywhere in the world, I can have at least four channels free. And then I have stems. So, you know, I'll cut it up in Ableton and, you know, intro, verse, pre hook, you know, whatever into sections. Then you can make it so if you push play on one scene, it'll just play and it'll go to the next one and the whole song plays through, you know, three and a half minutes. Or at any point I can take over and start looping any section. 
um, with mm-hmm. my feet because I play guitar when I sing. So I have a MIDI controller controlling Pro Tool or uh, controlling Ableton. That's sending out pro- program check uh, messages for my foot pedal and like my delay pedal. So it's all synced up. But what's cool is I can loop in Ableton. So the drums or the bass. If um, do you ever use a uh, Native Instruments Reactor? You know, I um, I think I'm using the Reactor Player for some plugins, and I'm, yeah. I'm I don't really know it very well. But in the past, I've looked at isn't Reactor the one where you can get in deep and you can so like draw yeah. connections between modules and create like you know beat remixing apps and yeah. all kinds of cool, crazy stuff. Almost anything. It's kind of like Max for Live for Ableton. You can create, they give you the in- infrastructure to basically create a Native Instruments plugin, you know, and they give you all the tools. So, so well. somebody somebody wrote one, and I do not know who it was. I wish I could give credit to this. This guy just put it up on the internet a few years ago. It's just a, a reactor program that um, has an endless feedback delay just going on all the time. And I'll put it on every track in Ableton. But what's cool is because it's it's a delay, it's not using the needle to, you know, to write on the hard drive. It's not recording anything. It's just literally just a delay. But I have pedal set up that I can grab the last eight or four bars of anything that just happened on stage per an instrument with just a MIDI trigger or have a DJ on a DJ board grabbing clips. When they hear me do something cool on the mic, he can grab the last four or eight bars, oh, quantize wild, it, man. you know, the geek and then, in me is yeah. getting all excited. Oh God! Oh God! Oh God! <laughs> I mean, seriously, like I, I, there is there's something really intriguing about like the technology and looping stuff. And yeah. I, I spent quite a bit of time on older versions of Ableton Live trying to figure out, okay, like how could I take um, some mic inputs with musicians or just myself or even just one input and like play through and create sounds and capture loops live. So I'm playing against it. And, and it, it just got really complex and interesting. Yeah. But, you know, I do know one, one question for you though, is, um, is, is one of the challenges of using all this technology to play through for a live gig, uh, somehow making sure that you don't, um, you know, end up with like a nasal pinch tone coming out of the, the monitor speakers where things are over-processed in the wrong kind of ways. Is that, are there certain tools you've, you're using that really have a full tone to what you're trying to do and don't kind of end up sounding, you know, squonky? Yeah, I definitely, um, we, we talked a little before about it, but the, the UA Apollo um, really just changed the whole thing for me because I'm used to having like Neve 1073s in the studio and 1176s and I can literally run 24 channels in through Apollos in Iraq Um all at zero latency with the uh, Neve 1073s and, and uh, some plugins on the input. So it's it's almost like I have, you know, a, a 1073 is what, four or five grand? And I'll have 24 of those on the input in real time while on stage. So I'm right. going through what feels like a real, I really, you know, I, I own them. I sold, I have sold all my outboard gear at this point. I had about 40 grand worth of outboard gear and this little Apollo twin sitting here on this chair right in front of me right now. I just sold it all because I just I got I got everything I need, but oh, that really cool. helps live too. Is um and the other huge benefit. So yeah, going in with you know a lot of that analog feel and and um, benefits, but then within, you know you you can you know I do a lot of you know limiting just to kind of um, fatten things up or a little bit of exciting excitement, but then like my electric guitar, I'll go in dry, and then send that out to my amp and then have that mic and have the dry. So later on I can fix it. And the, co- and the craziest thing is we use like um, an iPad controlled live mixing board that also has flying faders with Allen and Heath. And what's great is if we're doing, we can do the songs in any order, we can loop them however we want, but the automation of the mix, if the mixing engineer is using an iPad to control Ableton, all the automation is saved every night. So then you can go to you know um, r- right mode the first time and then go to touch mode from then on out. And then the live front of house engineer, if he grabs a fader, it fixes it for the next night too. That's so you literally wild. can automate your mix and then edit that later. You know, um, So I try and keep 
you know, enough analog tools that if like everything blew up, we could still rock like a band. Right. <laughs> you know, because if you have a computer, one out of 30 shows, something's going to happen. Okay. So That's, who, who is the yeah. band? Who's on stage with you? I mean, not, I mean, you can mention the names, but I mean, like what instruments are on stage with you for this, this show? Uh, yeah. I'm, I, uh, I've been doing a, a couple of weeklies here in LA where I've, um, I've been having a cajon player, which has been really cool. You know, my drummer that, um, yeah, you know, Iyashi Hamden, he, he, he was, uh, the Luther Vandross's drummer was his father for like 23 years. He was, uh, so it was, it's just this family of amazing drummers. He plays a cajon and that's awesome to loop. Um, yeah, this is like in a hotel, it's in the W hotel in, in Hollywood and, uh, they have you know, a bunch of rich people living two, two floors up, so they don't want it to be rocking too much, but then I'll get up there with an acoustic guitar through all these pedals and stuff so I can distort if I want and whatever, oh, um, cool. bass, uh, upright bass, cajon, acoustic guitar, but I, you know, it's mostly it more rocks than anything. Um, and then, uh, two violinists. Oh, so yeah, wow. it's really, it's been crazy. I, I was like, if I'm going to loop then let's make this a studio, I don't need to, there's so much other stuff coming out of the speakers. Um, you know, that it's just awesome to have eclectic instruments and, and something for people to really enjoy and look at, you know, that's wild. So it's loop. you, two violinists and a cajon, uh, drummer and bass and bass. Mm -hmm. And then, um, what about making sure that your sound is right? So you've got a live sound guy who's kind of mixing things based on the venue, but are there any lessons to be learned about preparing a, a, a sound like that? Um, do you do it in the studio and trust what's coming out of the studio monitors? Or is it really important to find yourself a rehearsal space with a real PA to know how all that stuff's going to kind of translate? Awesome question. Yeah. Um, I, I learned that the hard way. And when I started to work on tracks, a uh, uh, tour with two or three bands around the country. Um, and I, I think I learned the hard way because if you do your leveling in the studio, it is totally different to a PA. If yeah. nothing else, you you need to get 25 feet away from the speakers to understand how, you know, this is like, let's call it pre and post phasing, right. <laughs> like all the things that happen before it gets to the audience ear, all the phasing and stuff in this, these rooms that are made to resonate and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I usually, I'm really fortunate right now teaching at this, at this, uh, college with this amazing old theater with a, you know, uh, a PA and all that stuff. So I'll get on stage and really just rehearse, but I do recommend definitely, um, you know, I'm a live sound engineer, engineer, whatever, but I've, I've learned to turn it off when I'm on stage. I really, you know, I have a, a great sound guy that I really trust, but, um, first time in my life I ever could say that it only happened nice. two months ago. So yes. <laughs> where I'm like this, there, I, this guy I trust, but at some point you just got to be up there and be an artist. Um, you know, uh, you got to trust that they're hearing it. Don't think ever that, you know, what it sounds like from stage out there. Right, like I've, there's no one, uh, there's, there's major artists that I'll never work with again because they just can't get that in their head. You know, that what you're hearing through the monitor is not what the audience is hearing. Yeah. You might think you have to scream in the mic, but they're all they hear you is screaming really loud out there because you're blazing loud to them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's getting, it's, it's a lot, a lot of levels. I also put, um, I'm a big fan of when it comes to like live stems and stuff, normalizing, um, you know, so basically just taking the the highest point of the song and putting it at digital zero. So you get around the same amplitude per stem. Right. And then use using clip gain, you know, for, for the rest of it. And if you need to automation and stuff, but really averaging things out. If you, if you're making click tracks, make sure they're exactly the same volume, every single song that you, right. you can totally mess that up. Um, and then I do a light compression, light limiting on the output. Um, especially when you loop a lot, like sometimes I'll go nuts and loop seven vocals on top of each other. Of course the volume goes up. So you need to have some kind of, um, compression and eventually a brick wall. Yeah. Maybe and that's, point, that's coming yeah. from your Ableton so that yes. what, what, and you're sending out all these stems and the stuff from the Ableton to the live sound mixer. So you're trying to make sure that you're not sending them crazy levels basically. Exactly. Yeah. Leave, leave some some headroom from them to work with. And, um, well, yeah. that's, that's cool. And, and, uh, rock stars, I know this isn't really a show about live stuff. This is recording studio rock stars, but, um, this is relevant, I think. Uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll add this. 
So for me, I've been getting out and trying to play more too. And the first experience I had when I'd go out and play on a stage was was realizing that what I'd been rehearsing, you know, by myself with an acoustic guitar in a room quiet, it sounded nothing like that when I was on a mic on a stage. Everything sounds freaky and weird and the, the <laughs> monitors are coming back and you're like, you sound like an alien to yourself. And so I learned, you know, to start practicing on the shittiest PA setup I could here in my studio. I've got a, like a, I mean, it's kind of a cool one. It's a vocal sure, yeah. a sure vocal master, but it's, it's oh. loud and awkward and feedbacky and, you know, things are, and I think that's really good to get used to that. But I, the reason I think it's still relevant to the studio is there is still that experience when, you know, you're, you're working with an artist in the studio and they get into headphones in the studio experience. It is different from what they've been rehearsing at home. And so mm-hmm. there's that like getting comfortable factor and making sure they come in and listen on the speakers and realize that what they hear in the headphones is different from the speakers. Same thing uh, as the live stuff. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. I digress. Give people knowledge. You know, I, I'm a big fan of, um, I think, I think I'm, you're, you're the same way, Liz, that you're, you're a learner for life. Like you, yeah, totally. I'm addicted to learning. That's probably why I'm a musician, not vice versa, you know, yeah. uh, and, and an engineer, cause you can learn for the next 900 years and not know nearly as much as somebody else next to you, you know? Um, but knowledge is power. Like I'm really big on, especially live when someone's like, you know, I need, I need more monitor or I, I want reverb in my, in my monitors. Instead of saying, no, you don't get reverb in your monitors. Trust me, you don't want it. You know, instead of, you know, a lot of sound engineers will, will go there and, and be real snappy, inform them, say, listen, reverb is a, a repeat. Um, it's an extra copy, a bunch of little extra copies. So if we have reverb, that means we can't turn it up as loud because it's going to feed back sooner because there's more copies. And they'll be like, oh, okay. And then they're totally fine not having reverb because now they know that they can hear themselves. Say in the studio, let them know what they're going to hear. Um, so you're saying have, that the uh, spring reverb on my sure vocal master, I should turn that off upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, actually leave that, leave that, leave that one on. <laughs> yeah. Just letting people know, like, like you said, yeah. headphones, you can be the greatest singer in the world. You get behind that red light and it just feels different. Yeah. One ear off, one on. I do that a lot just so I can like keep perspective, mm-hmm. um, yeah. on, on things. Um, it's funny you, you know, the distinction between studio and live. For me, it's it's almost like, I mean, part of it is because I'm a performer. But even when I work, when I produce a record for another artist, or or you know, do the whole thing, you know, produce it, mix it, master it. I do that a, a lot, where it's like you know, the whole process. Um, it, it's almost the same thing to me. Every single artist needs stems for performance at this point, just in case. Mm-hmm. What if you get a smash hit? You need stems which means you have to start planning it out, which means pretty much the whole session you should have in mind, how is this going to translate to the stage? Um, and the way we make music today, it's so loop based that you're kind of doing that anyways. You know, you're already, you're kind of performing it and then getting, you know, hearing when you like it and all that stuff. Cause it's so loop based. So totally. And, and, yeah. you know, as, as a studio engineer producer, we're trying to help create you know, the product for whoever the artist is. And it might be a stereo mix that gets played back for somebody on their their iPhone, but it may just as well be what you just described, which is like all the stems that are going to make up the live show that allows this artist to even survive and go out there and ever get anybody to give a yeah. shit long enough to listen to the two-track mix. So yeah. it's really insightful to be able to, you know, hear you describe all these steps of making sure that those tracks are usable later and, and create a really cool live performance. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let's jump right back to some questions about production um, for next. So, you know, you're, you're working in tools like Logic and Melodyne. Um, I know you have a strong sense and understanding of uh, working with programmed drum beats, you know, Ableton Live. Um, what what kind of stuff do you know about um, getting the right programmed kick drum for production? Uh, basically, generally speaking, like, how do you end up with the right kind of low end. Let's say it's a, you know, a doom, 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 something, yeah. you know, something with a real four in the floor production, <laughs> fairly common yeah. in a lot of pop music these yeah. days. You think? <laughs> but, um, but you know, the point is that, that that becomes a bit of a centerpiece, certainly a centerpiece for the low end of, of the production. What are some things that you find as far as feeling confident that this is the correct low end for a track, as opposed to, 
this sounded cool today, but later on when you get there, you you know you listen to something else and you're like, oh, my kick drum sucks. Yeah, you know? totally. And, and uh, just talk about that whole process. Absolutely. Um, it, it is funny when you look back into the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s even. If you listen to kick drum volumes, they literally are a third as loud as they are in modern records. Totally. And and today it's like every genre, even country. You'll listen, you'll be like, God, that kick is hitting me right in the the throat, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, I've really focused on low end in the last, um, few years. You know, it, like I said, I, I felt like it was one of the final frontiers and it, I think it is for everyone. Um, one thing I'll go ahead and say is I got a sub pack. Um, you know, oh, yeah. uh, the, is that the, the, the thing you wear. Yeah, exactly. And now there's two versions. There's one that you wear like a, like a, <laughs> like a vest. It looks like a bomb though. So be careful <laughs> in public. Um, I had an engineer one and one of my assistants came and, you know, we were using inner monitors already. So he brought a sub pack and plugged in so he could feel the sub. I'm like, dude, you look like, no, you have to take that <laughs> off. <laughs> no, not, not, not with, you know, 10,000 people around and security guards everywhere. Um, no people shit. Are like, what is that? What is that? What is that? Anyways, uh, but you can wear it under, under your shirt or jacket, but then there's one that sticks under your, just melts under your chair. And that's what I use in the studio. So, um, obviously because mixing, you know, so, bit, and then you can plug your headphones in and just go silent, but then you really feel the low end. Um, you know, the lower, lower on your back is like 20 Hertz and up to, you know, near the top of your back is more like a hundred Hertz. So you can feel where it's hitting, um, mixing. It's a, it doesn't help me that much in mixing unless I'm like investigating a problem on low end, mm -hmm. but in mastering, it's really changed everything. Like a Ever since I got my sub pack, I've my low end is like fixed. Like wow, I love wow, wow. every record. Now, would you, you know? work in headphones with that sub pack thing going, or is this more like speakers, monitors, and studio, or just both? Doesn't matter. Both, both. I'm I'm a big fan of not staying in one. Um, uh, my my mentor's biggest thing was two, two points of reference at least for everything. Uh, art exists between two edges. So if there's cheesy and cool, you decide where you want to land. And then you add 800 variables like that, and there you are. There's your sound. Um, so he's always really big in having multiple points of references because it just resets your brain. You know, that's why you have multiple speakers and headphones in the studio. You need to get out of your own little world. You know, we all go down that rabbit hole. Um, Melodyne's the worst at it <laughs> because that <laughs> rabbit hole is forever. But anyways, um, Ain't no, so no rabbits. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, sorry, so, uh, we made that dumb joke earlier on the podcast where I was like, you get down to the bottom of the hole, you look around, and you're like, no rabbits or still rabbits, no rabbits. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you still, I go deeper and deeper chasing the rabbit. All right, cool. So, Absolutely true. So yeah, multiple but, points of reference. Um, this, yeah. The, the, uh, the sub pack is in your chair. And you were saying that, that at the production stage, the composition stage, that's where it's valuable. And then again, at the mastering, but maybe less so in the middle of the process through mixing. Yeah, basically with the with the sub pack, um, when I'm a being at the end. So like, let's say I'm doing a hip hop record and I like how a song on Kanye's last record hit. I'll bring it up and I'm I always put my references in the actual session. So you can, in Logic, I really like if you hold down Option and hit a solo button, it without any pops or clicks or any latency, it mutes everything else and solos what you solo. So for a being, it's really great. Um, but when you're a being, if you can literally feel the energy of the low end and feel where it's hitting on your back, you can just go in with an EQ and literally just move it around until it feels physically the same as Kanye's last record. That's wild. Then you take it, you, and it's almost not even about your ears. It's more about, I use it as a tool. Like, you know, obviously low end, it's the dimensions of the room that give you problems with low end in your room. You mm -hmm. know, um, it's not really, you can't really, you know, soundproof, you can put bass traps and stuff, but this thing is always consistent. I can do it in a coffee shop and literally master the low end of a record and feel pretty confident and then go hear it in the speakers later. Um, so yeah, that's, that's cool. a big thing um, when it comes to low end. About a kick drum, so that, that's, that's been one of my secret weapons. Um, I do, when I do electronic music, I do sometimes take a sine wave and turn it into a kick drum and really mess with the attacks and um, you know, bring up like an ES2 or something in Logic. But um, I do a lot of layering too where I'll take like a, a kick drum that has the low end I want and then maybe like high shelf it a little bit um, or high cut it, whatever, and then take something with the middle that I like and something with the top end and blend them. But I use um, Sound Radix Auto Align when I do that usually. Mm -hmm. um, it basically just puts things in phase, which can really help 
when you get that blended kick, then send that to a bus. Um, and on my entire low end bus, you know, so all the low end stuff from, you know, base to anything but kick is all leading to one bus. And then I do the whole, you know, side chaining, um, compression where I use this one plugin, uh, the vengeance sound multiband sidechain compressor, I think it's called. It has a really quick attack and release for the compressor. So when that kick hits, it triggers the compressor, the low end dips down a bunch, but before that kick is even done, the, the low ends back up, you don't even notice it, but then it leaves the whole speaker. The whole sub is for that kick for a second. And then the low end comes back in and right, nobody knows. You got, I'm going to make you back up and yeah, totally. that Sorry. one more time. So, and it was called the vengeance sound multiband compressor. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is side chain compressor. This yeah. is all, all the kicks are going together through one bus. And now we've just got a single fader and that here, he, like, We've we've sculpted this kick drum out of all these different things, but now we're on yep. one fader and we're listening to it. And on that fader, we might put the multiband sidechain compressor. No, uh, we'd actually uh, use that as the sidechain input to the the bass bus. Gotcha. So everything, let's say, but the kick, everything but the kick is the other anything below, let's say, 100 hertz. You know, it's kind of going to this bass bus, um, and that's what's being drastically lowered every time that kick hits. But like I said, it, it wraps right around the kick so quickly that it's within under four milliseconds and no one can tell. But it really just, I mean, everybody, every genre that, every every song I've worked on with any colleagues in the last five years, they've been doing something where they're side chaining the kick to the low end. Mm -hmm. Obviously EDM and stuff, you do that, that, that swell kind of Super stuff. Super pumping breathing, yeah. Yeah. But even for just you know getting a great drum sound, having that kick use the whole sub for a milli, you know for ten milliseconds, it's all yours, kick, um, and then the sub comes right back. Do you feel like you could use this similar trick and even like the sub pack if you were working on rock and roll with a big low end? Uh, absolutely, yeah. That's I. Um, a lot of my my stuff is rock and roll, and absolutely, it's the same. It's just about a being. It's about metering. Uh, to be able to have another way of of understanding your low end is a great great thing. Um, but definitely on rock to get that rock. I mean, especially modern rock, where rock has become either super busy or very uh, sparse. It seems like the, there's not as many people living uh, like overproducing. You know, kitchen sink or super emotional, like you know, uh, just a few instruments. Um, when mm -hmm. you have that wall of sound, getting a kick to really, really move, especially in a club, like you got to move these big, huge, you know, 18 inch subs, as opposed to in the studio, you might be moving, you know, 10 inches, 12 inches. So there's, um, you, there's some attack, you know, just physics. It's going to take a while for that sub to get the energy up to really yeah. punch someone in the, in the chest. So if you move everything out of the way, whenever it needs to be punchy, then it doesn't have to worry about all this other input to chase down into silence before it can move for that. Kick. You know, that's so, that ins sense? that's so <laughs> insightful. And it's such a, a helpful reminder that we always need to just keep coming back, especially everything in the low end, particularly just come back to that understanding that like it all boils down to a big, you know, it, in my studio, <laughs> there's, these are paper cones or a, some kind of a neoprene cone or something that makes a sub physically moving back and forth. And it's like, yeah, if you imagine that and you're like, you want that movement to just be like something simple that you can picture, or do you want it to be some complex thing? And what's that going to do to the speaker? Yeah. No wonder it's going to not sound as good, you know? Yeah. I mean, especially subwoofer. Uh, high end speakers are, are, you know, one, two inches. You send something through them, they immediately, you know, move waveforms. But those low end, like, it's like a big mammoth that has to get moving, but then that inertia, you know, will knock down buildings. So, yeah. Yeah. Nice. You know, you, you have to, yeah, you have to see it. You, Carving things out, obviously, in, in mixes, especially with these walls of sound we're expected to make these days. Yeah, you know, totally, you totally. really have to carve things out. And if, if it sounds bad solo, it might be perfect. You know, it's, you, you know, it doesn't have to sound good when you solo. It just has to sound good in the mix. Yeah, awesome. You know? All right, well, let's let's take that kind of kick drum, the, uh, the program drums production, and let's throw that back at Melodyne for just one sec. Um, what are some ways that Melodyne is... Um, cool or might be. And if the answer is you don't use it that way, that's fine. But what are some ways that Melodyne might be really useful for instrument and production and drum treatments and things like that, that we're not thinking about? Yeah. Um, I, I'd say I'd, when I do a full on record, like 
start to finish, I spend maybe 40% of all the time I spend on the whole record in melanine. Um, as opposed to whatever doll I'm working in, because yes, I throw all kinds of instruments through it. It's, it's just a magic wand. Like I said, it's popular for vocals. Um, um, let's say for that kick drum, especially like when we're doing EDM kind of stuff and you want that kind of thing, you can totally start time stretching. There's a new thing in the new version four of Melodyne, uh, where you can bring up a sound and then go to the harmonics section and it'll show you all of the partials. So, oh, yeah. you know, from the fundamental all the way up to maybe even the four, 400th and you can grab each one of those. This is a new window in the sound that we've just never had, you know, we've never had before. We've had, you know, pitch, width, depth, you know, amplitude, um, and a few more tools. But now we have this new window where, you could take all the overtones. Now, we're not talking about EQ. We're talking about the overtones. It's, it's a mm -hmm. difference. Let's say on a vocal, if someone's got a really nasally, like 4K kind of thing, instead of EQing it out, you could bring down the overtones that accentuate that nasalness as opposed to just the frequency 4K. Yeah. So it's like unbelievable what people are doing with it. With a kick drum, I would I'd start messing around with it, you know, changing the format, the EUE of a sound. So bringing a kick drum, if you lower the format, you can almost make it sound like grainy, like a bit crusher. Oh, super um, cool. Yeah, or take the the upper harmonics up and get that 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 clack at the beginning of a kick drum that attack but without having to turn it up in volume really just yeah. like bringing out the presence you know and, so and i like blow. that that simple uh, reminder that like by the way if you want your kick drum to be longer or shorter for the track you can just manipulate yeah. it right in melodyne and then also you bring a kick drum up and lo and behold it's it's holding a note yeah you know maybe maybe it's made from a sine wave whatever you tune that kick drum into the key of the song and you'll be so surprised how much better it sounds you know like tuning toms if you tune the toms on the live kit to the song they seem to just resonate better within the song now yeah. is it possible that we would find melodyne useful to take the multi-tracks of a live drum kit into and manipulate and time align drums in a cool way or is it, it does it not kind of have that multi-track phase coherence that we're used to in a DAW? well it does at this point so as of, I think, is it this version? Um, it's very recent, one of the latest versions. Now you can, like let's say you had uh, 10, 10 drum mics of a, on a drum kit. You can lock them all together so as you make moves, they all move together, kind of like you would a group Ooh. in Pro Tools or something. And that's that's new. For a guitar player, if I... I could never melodyne a lead guitar before because I would have three mics on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you melodyne one and then everything's out of phase. It's not officially phase accurate because the math doesn't totally work out because um it's not locked in phase because of some of the tuning stuff but i have not heard one artifact yet myself so That's cool. like i use it all the time um but what? for drums so uh, go ahead well i was just gonna say and there are times where i'm cutting vocals where we use a pair of room mics or we use two you know a, a clean vocal mic through a yeah. tube but we also take an, a 57 and run it through a guitar amp with a reverb yep. on it. And it's like, it's cool that we could be able to lock those and still manipulate the pitch on that vocal if we wanted. Yeah, so cool. Um, one thing that you mentioned drums. So you know how Melodyne can do the whole polyphonic tuning thing where right. the you, DNA. Know, you can have like, yeah, DNA where you have, you know, six string guitar and you can see all six strings, even if you just recorded it with one mono mic. It's amazing. It feels like magic every time we do it. Um, but what they've done now is... And this is only available in the studio version. This is the only reason they charge, what, $300 more for studio than the plug-in. Mm -hmm. um, is you can now, the way they their quantized engine works, they're looking polyphonically into the sound. So let's say, for instance, if, you're, if you try and quantize an entire live performance of a band, right, and it's a two-track, when, when that one comes around five, six, seven, eight, and on the one, let's say a kick drum hits, a guitar note, a bass note, a vocal, a piano, everyone comes in on one. Every other doll is going to basically take whoever came in earlier, so probably the worst musician in the band, whoever was rushing the most, they get the node. You know, they get the transit right. marker. Right. Um, so if you quantize and you're basically just pushing everyone back in time, um, looser and looser in time, and, it, you know, it can just sound quantized. Melodyne because of the polyphonic detection sees the piano and the kick and the bass and the, and the guitar as separate entities. And it constantly takes the, the average 
of each. Nice. So when you quantize, it, it pushes and pulls with the way the band was, um, kind of like RMS versus peak, you know, on a, on a, on a compressor, it takes that average, you know. And this would be a multi-track so, session where all those yeah. tracks are locked together. Yeah, yeah. So you can do that. Um, Very cool. you know, for the whole section. That, like for instance, the the movie uh, Straight Out of Compton. Mm-hmm. Um, they had three hundred songs they chose uh, to possibly put in the movie, and they were giving them to all these big, you know, hip hop uh, artists and DJs to remix. But a lot of them weren't on the grid. So um, Harvey Mason Jr. Hired three people. It took them three months in flex time and logic. They lined them up to the grid so they could have Pharrell and all them, you know, remix. We did it all in three minutes when we went to their studio wow. because it's looking polyphonically and it still had that hip hop because it's hard to flex time and keep that hip hop, you know, pocket. It's mm-hmm. all about the pocket. So, right. but Mel and I was able to just run it through. So those, those are some of the cool things. Um, if you work with Skrillex, he's, he's got Mel and I up all the time. You no, know? I say, t- tell us some Skrillex yeah. stories. I saw him play at yeah. Bonnaroo, which, where I've been working. This will be my 14th year. And, I mean, like I'm just like, you know, uh, showing my my secret uh, DJ wannabe-ness. But uh, the Skrillex <laughs> show was one of my most exciting shows to go see. Even Absolutely. though people would be like, dude, he's just playing back tracks. Or whatever, but I don't care. Yeah, what, yeah. Tell us some Skrillex, Skrillex stories. Well, I am from North Carolina. And uh, when I worked at an Apple store in North Carolina – one of the members of his old band before he became a DJ, um, uh, you know, was one of my colleagues. And the first thing about him, he's kind of like, kind of like Bruno Mars. I have not heard one bad thing about him personally nice. through someone in the studio or in in the business. Uh, super nice guy, been really great. Um, a, a lot of his uh, fellow producers would come to our to my old studio. Um, I don't want to call them ghost producers. They're just like. Like just people that are super dope also that help mm-hmm. Skrillex come up with ideas, whatever. Um, but yeah, they would, they'd be in there and it's just crazy to see when he'd come in to tweak things up at the end, you saw where, okay, that's why he puts his name on it because he just made it amazing. It was just cool before. Um, so, you know, he would come in and bring up Mel and I and start doing the and get all that stuff going on. He would take a lot of, you know, a lot of his bases and elongate them to basically like, you know, take the image resolution down on a, on a JPEG, like suddenly it's all pieced out, but then build it, build something back from that. You know, he's all, all over the place. There's, you know, for him, it's all about vocals, creating synths now because everybody can have the same presets and Spire, but no one can make a synth based on your voice other than you, you know, what's, what's Spire? Uh, Oh, uh, Spire is a, it's a virtual instrument. Um, kind of like, you know, massive or, um, any, any of the verse alchemy or whatever, mm-hmm. just a synth. Uh, I think it's got four oscillators. I'm not sure. I, I forget how many oscillators, but it's just, it's one of the ones that like all the kids are using it because it's pretty, pretty amazing. Nice. Um, Spire is really cool. Uh, there's a few, you know, obviously they're all using Ableton until they have to mix a record. They're like, Oh wait. <laughs> now, I will say this about Ableton. <laughs> In my playing around with Ableton Live, one of the things I discovered is the stereo bus, you can just simply push everything as loud, almost as loud as you want to go into the stereo bus until it goes into the red, and it sounds great. And yeah. that was an interesting yeah. difference between my experience in Pro Tools, where you're like, you know, you see the red, and you're like, okay, I better back off. Yeah. No, I, I, it feels more like a desk than, than like... It's got a sound. Like you can tell when something came from Ableton, but it happens to be a great sound. Kind of like tape. You know, mm-hmm. people, when you track the tape, if you actually know what tape does, then you can pretty much recreate it. I mean, there's a, a boost at 60 hertz. There's a that great dip between like 2 and 5K that happens on tape. Well, if it's doing that to every one of your tracks and you do 16 tracks and you've just removed a lot of the harshness right there between 2, two and 5 or whatever. Same with this. Like it's it's Ableton has a sound but it just happens to be one that we like. Yeah. So I, I, I love how Ableton sounds. But I went mastered through it because I can hear. Um, it seems to kind of just, it almost feels like it, it, it puts things in a package, like rolls off the lows, like with a high, nice Nyquist um, slope or whatever, and then rolls off the highs way up. It feels like, you know, it just feels like it's doing something like that. But What's it a, do you good, have a so. go to um, tool for you if you're going to do mastering yourself? Do you have a go to yes. DAW or anything? Yeah, um, <laughs> I do. I I do it in Logic usually. It's more about the outboard uh, gear. I do. Ha- I, I like how Logic 
Logic's engine sounds um, on the output. Um, but I, I got to call them out. The IK Multimedia, you know, I've, I've liked them for a long time. I've had some stuff I use, some I don't. But the T-Rex uh, Stealth Limiter, have you used that yet? I don't think I've used that one, no. My God, I, I think I have them all. I'm pretty sure I have every limiter in the world. And I, me and my, um, I have a mastering, uh, mixing mastering company with a partner in DC. And, uh, and you know, we're both just super nerds about anything new comes out. We got to, you know, put it up against the test and nothing has even come close. Since I started using Stealth, I can, I can really compete a little more. It's got a great ISPL. So I can, you can push up into the ceiling and really get it loud and keep dynamics more than any other one. It doesn't distort as early. I mean, I've used them all from you know, all the wave stuff to all the, you know, even the UAD stuff just really loved like, that's it. That's it for me. That's <laughs> for cool. a while. I, I have Love used that. like the that's old T Rex and I remember really being amazed with some of the stuff I did. I mean, we're talking yeah. about like six, seven years ago or something using that using that yeah. and and it really sounded great um just uh in just no no disrespect but um w- when you use the stealth limiter i don't have like uh pop up windows trying to upsell me on on new plugins or anything do i not at all no it's it's a okay, pro cool, it's, cool. It's, awesome. it's a pro situation absolutely no i i um there is a mastering engineer uh over at united mastering that's really great and he he turned me onto it and and ever since i've been like oh this is amazing. Super you know? cool. I'll have to check that out. Do you know um, Warren Sokol? Warren Sokol? Um, S- boy, that, that's so familiar. I'm not sure if I yeah. do. He just became the head head over the new United uh, Mastering, and it, it sounds great. It's an awesome new room. Okay, cool. Right. Well, it yeah. sounds like another person I have to have on the show. Yeah. Um, any questions? I didn't. There was one. I, I thought I'd ask you a general question, just from your 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 angle of teaching. Um, what it if you want to share anything, like what are the questions that you're generally speaking, like what do your students want to know about the recording and the mixing process? What are some, you know, you always see this come up kind of stuff or, or anything you want to address? Yeah. Um, it's, it's usually at the beginning. One of the first problems is always muddiness. Like what, why are my mixes so muddy? Mm-hmm. Well, you you have to low cut every single track for the rest of your life live or in the studio except for kick and bass forever <laughs> you know like you have to get rid of all that fat you know people moving around with a mic stand and there's like some 40 hertz like rumble going on that's moving your limiters without you even hearing it mm-hmm. in your mastering um because that, of course everyone wants to get things loud but you do have to carve out room throughout your frequency spectrum because you don't want the one one thing to be peaking so much, pushing your limiters too much, and then you can't get the rest of it loud. Um, that that's a big thing, the muddiness. Um, and then of course, uh, of course, latency. <laughs> you know, that's the endless fight for all of us. Is, latency is in, in terms latency, of just you know? what you hear in the headphone coming through. Exactly. The mic. Understanding buffer sizes is kind of like you know something um, that confuses people at the beginning, but. Uh, a lot of these new DOS, I know Pro Tools has an, a low latency mode as of 12, I think now. So mm-hmm. um, those really, really help so, so much. So the the answer to that, like if somebody's new to this, is that latency is, and we didn't used to have this when it was analog tape and desks, we uh-huh. didn't experience this. Even mm-hmm. with like, uh, you know, some of the high end uh, systems like my Pro Tools HDX or a TDM system, the latency was already short enough that you you kind of don't notice it, although there are people who mm-hmm. also notice that. Um, but Rockstars, it's just simply, since we've all gotten used to these, you know, USB or Firewire or um, Thunderbolt connection interfaces to our computers that are running natively, we've, ever since that was introduced, we've had to accept that with that comes latency, which is the time it takes to, for the signal to go through, get processed by the computer and come back out the headphones to your ears and, um, you know, I guess, roughly speaking, a couple of ways to address that is either go into the preferences of the DAW and try and reduce the buffer size down as low as it'll go so that it's a very quick trip through the computer or use an interface like the Universal Audio, right, where it's doing the input and the output going back to your headphone sort of externally at the interface before it goes into the computer. Would you, would you yeah. say that's accurate? Is there any other stuff we want to point out? Yeah, um, I'd say that one thing that uh, kind of got me for a few years was, you know, if you raise your buffer side, let's say you're you're done tracking and it's and it's time to mix, um, 
if you have a lot of tracks, like if you have over 120 tracks on a session, which happens, you know, unfortunately, uh, the, if you go too high with the buffer size, you're giving a lot of power to the CPU, but not as much to the reading and writing from the hard drive. So you can also go too high. A lot of people just say, go all the way up to 1024 or, or I think in Pro Tools it's 256 or something. Yeah. Um, uh, go all the way up when you're mixing, but it, it gives you less kind of real time um, streaming from your hard drive. So you have to kind of find a happy balance when you're tracking. Of course you get it as low as you can without your computer, not having enough to run, to run the stuff. But like you said, the UAD, it's got two computers in it, one on the machine input, one on the output. And, and it just really, um, you can even go zero latency if you want. I, I, I talked to one of the reps we were doing a shootout. We wanted to do a shootout, but um, one of the parties wouldn't agree. I won't say which one. But the UAD rep explained to me that Pro Tools HD um, has, I think it's uh, 0.7 milliseconds of latency, so it's almost zero latency. Mm -hmm. But as you add pro, as you add plugins, the latency raises each time you add a plugin. Mm -hmm. UAD made a decision to say you you have 1.2 milliseconds of latency up to five plugins on the input so one or five it's just 1.2 milliseconds of latency no matter what and usually you don't use more than five plugins on the input you know uh, you've uh, never seen my input no i'm just yeah kidding. right preamp compressor maybe an eq maybe a couple things but um so they're both pretty much zero latency unless you're you know a Cuban conga player and you know rhythm right. like a, a god <laughs> well i think i think a, a reminder too is um when we're recording somebody else, we're just hearing what's coming out of the speakers. And we have to remember to be popping on headphones and go listen, you know, talk in the mic and listen because somebody may or may not know to let you know that the latency is not as good as it should be and it's screwing them up. You know, if it's extreme, somebody might go, I, I hear an echo, you know, but mm -hmm. if, if you're working with an artist that isn't familiar with the DAW and the preferences and latency settings, then they're really relying on you to get that right. And it can really screw up somebody's ability to uh, play an instrument, um, you know, timing wise or pitch wise, if their latency is sounding wrong in the headphones, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my God. That's, that's the hardest thing. Uh, the hardest thing is when you're on a big, big stage and you get that slap back two seconds later on every single thing you do. And it's not in rhythm in any way. And, you know, that echo coming back from the, the stadium or the, the amphitheater can be, you have to tune it out. Especially right. if you're a drummer, you just have to like literally like learn to tune it out. <laughs> That's pretty wild. Yeah. Same problem. Same problem. You know, it's like what we were talking about before yeah. about rehearsing with a crappy PA so that you don't get distracted yeah. by how freaky things sound. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or, or list or buy some oratones for the studio to hear and through tiny little speakers, you know, yeah. Yeah, perspective. All right. Well, um, let's, let's jump into kind of our closing question here. This one's hypothetical, but uh, we're going to take the way back studio machine and you're going to go back and find young Derek Olds. Um, we've been talking <laughs> so long. I almost forgot where you started out. Oh, you were in North Carolina, maybe. And, um, <laughs> yes, and, and yes. you know, you're going to go there and show up in the, uh, where, were, where were you working? Were you working in a music store or some record store? Um, at the beginning, uh, uh, for Apple and then in, in oh, living Apple, studios, right. okay. so, so in living and recording studio, you're, you're so. walking into the Apple store and, and young Derek's in there and, and, um, and you go up to him and he's like, he's like, older Derek, what are you doing here? You know, he's like, well, <laughs> my iPhone sucks, man. Can you fix this for me? No, yeah. that's not what you say. You say, listen, I've come to, my iPhone does suck and I want you to fix it for me, but I also <laughs> want you to, uh, to, um, to give you this bit of advice, here's the single most important thing you need to know when you get get out of the Apple store and go be a rock star of the recording studio yourself. What, what advice would you go back and give yourself? Huh, yeah, uh, I'd say the, the first thing uh, is probably that just if someone would have just really let me know that mistakes are your best chance to pull people in. To if you're a performer or in the studio, if you if you handle mistakes or things happen and you handle them well, people see the humanity and see it gives you a chance to show them how much you truly understand something. Because when you fix something and you know why it broke, people are really impressed. Um, or if you're on stage and you hit a bad note, it literally is your chance where the crowd's like defenses are kind of down. They're about to judge you or not. And then you can 
if you if you're humble about it and you let them know, hey, I'm just, I'm an artist, so I do every day. That makes me laugh when I mess up because it's 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 fun and 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 it's I'm a human kind of thing. Right. So I, I really wish I think it would have helped me when I was because I started out in a band that. Every, all four other members were amazing. And I, I knew five chords when I first started, but I was writing the song. So nice. I was like way behind and there was so much pressure. And I remember as a young artist, you haven't proven to yourself over and over and over that you will come up with another great idea. So don't hold on to your first idea that you know is great. And you might be totally right that it's the best thing, but you don't have to fight so hard for each idea because I promise you'll make rent next month and next month and next month but you're freaking out right now because it's your first month. I yeah. wish somebody would have just let me know that I will. Human beings are geniuses. We are all so amazing. If, if someone acts dumb, it's an act. People <laughs> are just, you know, being lazy because p- human beings are amazing. Um, you will have another great idea. So instead of fighting with your band and breaking up and, and all that stuff, you might just say, you know what? Let's take your idea, my idea, and, and try and combine it. Um, the other thing would be split sheets do split sheets. If I had all the money I should have, it, you know, it'd be a whole different story, but, um, What's a split that's sheet? easier said than done. Yeah. Great. Uh, <laughs> basically if you write a song in a room and there's five people in the room, two are sleeping on the couch and three are helping you write, you split that song five ways, 20% each, unless there's a split sheet. Um, it's equal share to anyone in the, you know, legally on um, there, you know, someone's farting on the couch in the back, through the whole session, they still get their percentage. A split, <laughs> and, uh, you know, don't let people bring their girlfriends and boyfriends into the studio because they get a percentage if they want. Oh, fascinating. Um, wow. Yeah. A split sheet is basically just a sheet that says, here's everyone that was involved. Here's the percentage of publishing, uh, the, the the songwriting um, ownership that they're, they're going to have. Um, uh, you know what? I'm going to actually answer your question now. If somebody <laughs> could give me one thing of advice, it would be, to split things evenly whenever possible and f- throughout your whole career and every asset. If you co-write with someone, instead of being like, well, I, I just wrote, I actually wrote 75% of it. You wrote 25. Just split it down the middle. A, you have an ally. You have two people pushing the record hard. If you got eight people on a record and they're all getting e- equal percentage, they're all going to be, you, you now have a marketing team. Right. You have all that power. Over time, I started about four years ago, I, I split everything. Pretty much 50-50 or 33.3 as much as possible. And I just have less headaches in life. Yeah. And everybody seems to really root for my success because it's their success too, as opposed to everyone trying to like carve out their little piece, you know. Well, so, that's great, um, man. That's great advice. And yeah. I mean, here we are with this podcast. I mean, that that's the whole end game yeah. here is just to try and en- encourage everybody to uh, be making their best records. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, because we are all in this together. Um, I really appreciate what you do, by the way, Liz. Um, thanks, I've, Derek. I've heard of you. I've heard of you for uh, about three years from a lot of my colleagues at at Nam and and through all the stuff. And um, when I saw you coming through this this time, I made sure I met you, and I'm really glad I did. And I really appreciate appreciate you having me on. My pleasure, dude. It's been yeah. awesome uh, doing this talk with you too. And you know, I enjoyed meeting you, but like spending this time with you and just really digging into all these details. It's a lot of fun to hear your all this wisdom flow out of you to help us out. So we really appreciate that. So cool. So cool. All right. Dig it, dude. Let the rock stars know how they can find you online, learn more about you. Uh, where do they go to pick up your new record as it drops? Um, yeah. So it's it's Derek, uh, D-E-R-E-K, Olds, O-L-D-S, like Oldsmobile. Derek Olds Music is all social media and website and all that stuff. Um, I'm going to be releasing... Um, I'm in final negotiations. I'm not sure if it's going to be with a label or uh, if my own label, which I, I have a label, depending on the funding, right? Uh, so mm-hmm. it, um, the, the first three songs are being released in May um, to be announced, but I'll know in the next couple of weeks how I'm putting it up. So I hope Dig it, it's, it's well, going to be exciting either way. Good luck with it. And um, you know, just as an aside, go check out uh, what's happening in cryptocurrencies and music. Maybe you can just release it on Music Coin or one of these new platforms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that is a big part of my decision making right now is is uh, some of the some of that stuff, and you know we just might be funding it ourselves. So nice, man. That's, awesome, that's what you want. <laughs> awesome, dude. Thanks so much for being on the podcast with us. Absolute pleasure hanging out with you. I look forward to seeing you around the studio again. And um, thanks for being here, man.
Thanks a lot. And uh, you guys make some music. Make right. some music. Make some music. <laughs> um, cheers. Rockstar's a reminder that you can find uh, links to what we're talking about in the show notes with Derek. Um, just click through on your mobile device or go to rsrockstars.com, magnifying glass, search for Derek, and, and I, I'm sure it will pop up. And then uh, just one last shout out too. If you're if you're looking for more training about mixing yourself and you're new to this, go take my free mix training course at mixmasterbundle.com where I show you how to mix using all free plugins in any DAW. I use Pro Tools, but these these same techniques would work anywhere. Basic stuff that will really help you get a handle on some of um, how to treat a bunch of instruments and get your track sounding cool. Thanks so much for listening. Derek, you rock, dude. Thanks for being here. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, man. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.